Now, press the big, uh, press the giant go live button, which means that theoretically, oh, that was a, that was a bit shonky. Oh, I've forgotten how to do live ones. Hello, everyone in the chat. Hello, everyone in the chat. Welcome, um, welcome those watching after the fact. Welcome to all of our audio only listeners. Hello, everyone. We're, it's a live rail natter, it, just like the olden days. You remember that was the start of the month that we had the last one of these. I think it was quite a while ago. I've done lots of pre-records. Um. We're there. Danny is, is, is here with us. Danny is, is, is joining us. Actually, Danny, let's I'll tell you what. Let's let's go big face for both of us if I press this button. Danny is here. Hello, everyone. Hello, Danny. Hello. You have a very nice signaling panel behind you there. Uh, very nice. Yeah, so we're... Um, we're, we're, we're sh right before we crack on, Danny. It's lovely to see. You. We're going to do some. We're going to do some news, and then we're going to we're going to meet Danny properly, everyone. So, without further ado, uh, since we're streaming and people can see us and they're waving in the chat, hello to everyone in the chat. Um, I'm going to go back here, and we're going to do some news. So to start with, um, uh, I'm going to press this button and make my cursor disappear. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Start with. Oh, actually, and also because we might end up John Maddening during this. Uh, doing this episode and and scribbling on diagrams so i'm gonna make sure i've got my uh, my wacom device out right so the news well actually no before the news it's time to look at the um the covid stats so uh, people were asking for me to put the covid stats up and um, yes the it, it's a bit strange actually the moment so you can see if i go uh, if i go down here you can see uh, we've had we kind of plateaued a bit recently, and then rail is sort of dropping off. So, Danny, just to to, get, to kind of detail what these numbers are, these are the uh, and for anyone who's not seen before, these are the UK transport usage statistics across different modes um, since the start of this year. Um, I didn't put the overall ones overall for COVID, but this is sort of so you can see we started pretty much as low as we got during the pandemic at the start of this year, and rail ridership has been kind of climbing steadily, just as um, you know. So that's the blue one, uh, the pinky purple one here is bus usage again, kind of climbing steadily. Um, road usage, pr much starting from a much higher point, and that that climbed pretty steadily, and then cycling, um, a bit more variation, but actually again climbing steadily. Back to and this is these are relative numbers, so it's climbing back to 100% of pre-COVID figures. So strangely enough, everything's sort of plateaued off, um, and rail is has dipped away again, which is a bit strange. Uh, any any thoughts and ideas for that um, in there? Oh yeah, that's a good point. Someone suggested some news. I've forgotten to put into the news, uh, which I should have. Um, so yeah, uh, there we have it. That's that's the the, the transport usage stats. Um, I don't really don't really have any, anything to comment other than uh, we're still locked down, and uh, ish, you know, not not uh, to an extent, and also you know uh, we've got a reduced timetable and social distancing still in place. So I, I'm not expecting to see. I, I think we have kind of reached a bit of an asymptote that we're not going to exceed until there's a change in timetable and a change in social distancing rules. Whether that should or shouldn't happen is kind of another discussion. So there are the stats, everyone. Um, right, the news. First interesting bit of news is um, uh, data, lots of data. The, the the government, this is a good news thing. This is a thing that is good that the government has announced, which is um, kind of as part of the GBR uh, stuff. This is possibly the first big Great British Railways thing to happen, which is a unification of lots of data sources, um, which is positive. Uh, Britain's Railways, one of the things we do really well is open data. And this is really an expansion of that. It's allowing it, you know, it's a proliferation of a lot more data. So it allows a lot of clever people to do lots of clever things. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll get uh, someone like Peter Hicks to come on and, and talk about uh, data and um, uh, open train times and some of the uses that you can get with open data. That could be quite interesting. In fact, there are lots of people who, who follow the show who do um, all sorts of data things. So that could be quite interesting. So that's that's one news item. Next news item. Ah, yes, the, uh, the time we're metro interiors. Um, they've been announced today, which is quite exciting. And the reason why I've put this up in this merits a news item, um, hello chap in charge, um, is because these, you know, these are uh, another Stadler fleet, so they're incorporating a lot of the learning that happened on Mersey Rail. But of course, the Tynemuir Metro was one of the first, you know, the first um, railway system to have level boarding across the whole system to start with. Um, and so these trains continue that. So it's it's interesting to see that that kind of nice full circle that that um, the Mersey tra travel. Uh, kind of uh, learning that's happened in introducing the 777s over on uh, in Liverpool and the surrounding area is now happening in, uh, in time and we're to, to introduce these new trains. So that's quite exciting. Um, yeah, I think we'll look quite smart. I like those. They look nice. Uh, lots of space for wheelchairs, lots of space for bicycles. Um, yeah, good stuff. 
What next? Uh, oh, right. Uh, the next thing is a fun thing, uh, which is uh, it's it's well, it's Pride for starters. It's been Pride Month for well, it's almost the end of Pride Month actually, and I've not really said anything because we haven't done any many live uh, rail matters. So the first thing I want to say is um, is Happy Pride to those uh, who uh, who have been who who treasure Pride Month as a chance to kind of feel supported by you know other other LGBTQ plus people in the community as well as allies uh, and i'm pleased to say that the rail matter discord is a, is a really nice safe space for um as it rightly should be for um for everyone in you know kind of uh, lgbtq plus community um as it should remain and it and, and, and as it should absolutely remain um but as evidenced by the tweet that this scott rail tweet uh, kind of prompted actually just prompted one reply which was nasty and it promptly got put to bed by steve from uh, from scott rail so you got the standard reply, which I have to say is now re- deleted, and I'm glad because I wouldn't want to put it, give it any prominence anyway. Um, but yeah, there's like this response to this tweet. Uh, that this it's nice. The, the class three two one painted in pride colours, Scott Rail pride kind of Scott Rail's new pride train, which is really nice. Um, and then someone did the classic response of, well, where when's the straight? Uh, you know, when's the straight pride train? When's the straight colours train uh, going? Which was. Uh, neatly put to bed by uh, Steve from Scott Rail, who pointed out that straight people aren't punched in the face for holding hands with their life partner, nor are they, uh, they executed in other countries simply for being straight. Please educate yourself on the matter before commenting such nonsense. And then obviously everyone generally felt very good about this tweet because um, it was, uh, it, you don't often see people being blunt uh, in corporate social media. So uh, it was a nice moment. And, and Steve uh, has, I think, got crowdfunded a lot of uh, booze uh, thanks to <laughs> thanks to the popularity of their robust response. So yes, um, what can we do during uh, during Pride? Well, it's, we've had the month. Hopefully, everyone's been good allies. Uh, but also, if if you want to go in and, and follow the progress train, uh, you know, it was August last year that the pro- Pride that the the Vanti Pride train got named Progress Train. Uh, go and support Progress Train on Twitter. Um, muscle in on any Twitter beef that they might get caused by people get angry on there. Um, and get get stuck in. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, it's, uh, I, I've done a bad job of, of of representing during Pride this 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 month, so I felt I needed to uh, to point out and uh, and give everyone a. Has Steve made himself public yet? Asked Gareth Williams. No, but um, I, I think everyone's sending Scott Rail suggestions that they they need a pay rise, so that's fine. What's next? Ah, yes. Okay, so. Um, We've got another trailer because Tim and Tim's on the television again with City Holloway talking about the underneath of of London, uh, which should be quite fun. Uh, so, tra- trailer time. London transport experts Tim Dunn and City Holloway are going underground. Wow, what a space! I tell you what, I need to do, everyone, midway through this advert, is uh, very quickly do some. Things. Danny, this is how professional uh, rail natter is, uh, in that I have to. Mid uh, mid episode, alter where my sound is. is Capital's jewel in the crown as never seen before. Well, this is a bit bizarre, isn't it? A ticket office underground. It is. Together, they'll be unlocking the hidden places. I've always wanted to see inside this. A lot of people have no idea this is all here. Revealing the untold stories. What was the feeling like on that very last train? It was absolutely fantastic. And uncovering the subterranean secrets of the London underground. Nobody would look for a nuclear bomb. We're in the middle of suburban Hampstead. Starts Tuesday the 13th of July on Yesterday. So there you go. That, uh, Danny, sorry, you didn't get any of the sound from that at all because the sound weirdly doesn't travel through Skype, uh, which I've yet to work out how to fix. But uh, yeah, so Tuesday 13th of July, new series of Secrets of the London Underground. That should be interesting. Um, I've put my I've put my Chiron over the top of Siddy and Tim's face. Sorry, Siddy and Tim. Anyway, um, tune in. It's, it's nice to have uh, Tim back on the telly. Anyway. Oh, uh, what next? Ah, well, you'll be happy to know, everyone, that we're through the news. There we are. Uh, we're only 11 minutes in. Now, Danny, <laughs> I, I told I did war, pre-warn you that there was a, there was going to be a question in this, and and um, it was so someone else recognised. I, tw- I tweeted this picture out um, early in the week. So I was at the railway museum over the weekend, um, guiding a friend around, and this is a. This was an entire box lifted wholesale, uh, essentially, and taken up to York from a certain location. And the uh, and and the interlocking and the and well, it's not a panel. And the the f- the frame and all the little mini levers are all present. Do you know where this box came from? Yes, I think it's probably Borough Market Junction. 
It is. It is. There we go, Danny. That was. It wasn't. I, I, I didn't think it was too hard. It looks fantastic. It, it, it's kind of hidden away in a corner, and you have to kind of peer through the windows to get the view of it. But it, it's actually a, a real gem um, that I hope they mm. raise prominence of. Actually, um, it looks fantastic. Yeah, we had a Swinton panel visit there a few years ago. We got to go inside and take photographs and everything. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, so, right, enough of me yammering on. We're going to have a proper chat and meet Danny and let Danny introduce himself momentarily. But before we do that, it only really remains for me to say, um, welcome to tonight's Rail Matter. Lovely in City 225, fading away. Marvellous. And uh, I think it's high time we... Uh, well, first of all, looked at the, there's this, this nice picture of some old signal. I tried to find the, a, an image of the oldest railway signal as a kind of a way to sort of kick us off um, and failed, but I did find this lovely engraving, um, which is probably not that... I think it's quite still quite old, but it's certainly also not that old and re it's recognisably a railway signal and a railway signal box. Um, I think this dates from the 1840s or something, I think, this, this engraving, but you might be able to inform me better on that. Um, but it already looks like the shape of a standard sort of uh, bit of signaling equi equipment. Um, but anyway, that's a picture. More importantly, Danny, we've got you back on screen, so we, we get a chance for <laughs> to actually have you uh, tell us things. Danny, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Firstly, I suppose before we kick off, um, maybe you want to introduce yourself and let us all know what you do. Uh, yes, okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Danny Scroggins. Um, I run an organization called Swindon Panel Society, which I'm plugging throughout this video with this picture in the background. Uh, <laughs> but I've also worked for quite a number of years in signaling and operations and safety and rules, uh, both on the main line and on heritage railways. So signaling is definitely, definitely my thing for anyone that knows me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and, and hence why we have you on to talk so lots of people. So so we there are people in the in kind of on Twitter and within the our kind of um, social media bits and pieces and in the Discord server, um, regularly ask for. In fact, you are a suggested guest by in fact by some of our um, my Patreon supporters. Oh, wow. um, so I know right. Um, and uh, and and we ha and there's constant requests for more signalling content. And uh, and so this is kind of contributing to that, and I think fits nicely. And we had Melanie describing some of some of the signalling principles and some of the bits and pieces. And um, you're now going to talk us through the the kind of the three generations of signalling control and interlocking, which I think it's it's really neat. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be good fun. And um, in the chat, we already have people saying yes. No, I haven't mentioned the Elephant and Castle fire. I don't know why I kind of forgot about it, but there, there was a fire and it, it melted lots of parts of Elephant and Castle station. Yes, that did happen. Um, uh, I don't know if they've, I think there's quite a lot of damage and um, uh, yes, I, I think, uh, but I, I'm not sure to what extent they've re in, re reintroduced ser the services are running through, I think, but I, the station's not in not not up to full full tilt again yet um not ideal um anyway right so oh crikey we've already we're, we're 14 minutes in danny and I, i've 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 waffled horribly already so without further ado let's get our miniaturized faces up and um and kick off really so we're gonna start with um well actually this t talk us through this slide so this is a nice slide that you put together um which really describe i suppose you're describing well in fact tell us exactly what this is describing uh, yes, okay. Um, what I've tried to describe here is the, the various parts of a, of a signalling system. And it's quite important that it starts over on the left-hand side with the square that I put system operator, which is the person who presses the buttons or pulls the levers or, or does whatever they're going to do, who in the present day on the, on the mainline railway is called a signaller, historically called a signal man, lots of other job titles as well. And then to jump to the very other extreme is the train driver, and this whole signalling system is about controlling the movement of trains and regulating them and stopping them crashing into each other or other movable infrastructure. And everything that happens on that flowchart is ultimately just delivering information to a driver uh, to control a train. Now, in some ways, we can take that control away from the driver if they don't sort of obey what the signalling system is telling them to do. Mm. But primarily, it's about giving instructions to another human being at the other end of the flowchart. 
um, so that they can control the train. Um, so to step through the steps in the middle, starting with the signalman on the left hand side, um, there's got to be some sort of interface between the human and the signalling machine. And the three key interfaces that we're going to talk about this evening, mechanical lever frame, panel and VDU signalling system. And that's sort of how they occurred in, in chronological order. There's massive overlap um, in terms of their, uh, their, their years of, of activity and there's still plenty of mechanical lever frames and there's plenty of lever frames that are older than panels. So although they occurred in that order, they haven't disappeared in that order. After we've interfaced the human to the machine, there's a quite important part of the signaling system called the interlocking. And this is what um, arrests a lot of potential human errors, um, such as setting of conflicting routes where trains could be directed towards each other or, or uh, trying to give a train a, a signal authority to move when the points are not correctly set or a swing bridge is open or anything like that. Hmm that the, the tools that the signaler will use are going to be interlocked together to try and remove as much as possible uh, opportunity for human error. There's principally three types of those. There's mechanical, and again, this is in chronological order. Then there's electromechanical, which involved primarily electrical relays. And then there's an electronic, a solid state uh, version. And again, they came along in that order. They haven't gone away in that order. All of those examples still exist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in, and, yeah quite substantially, yeah. Uh, mm. Even, even with mechanical, not, there's plenty of that still about, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's not a direct relationship. Let's just make this clear. It's not a direct relationship that every mechanical frame must have a mechanical interlocking, every panel has an electromechanical interlocking, and every VDU system has an electronic interlocking. There are some permutations that you can't do, but... Um, there's a, a bit of a misconception that if it's a mechanical lever frame, it must have a mechanical interlocking and it must be controlling semaphore signals. And, and that's just not true. You can mix and match quite a lot of different permutations um, of interface and interlocking. Uh, the next step after the interlocking is that somehow has to be connected to the outside world. It has to be connected to the, to the track side equipment. The oldest mechanical systems use wires and rods. So wires that are normally sort of slack when you operate a lever, it pulls the wire into tension and that uh, operates a mechanical signal at the other end of the wire. When the lever is put back, the wire goes slack again and either a balance weight or the weight of the signal itself pulls itself back into the danger position. And this is the first example of something that's going to run throughout this, uh, this sort of signaling theory is, is this concept of signaling failing safe. We talked about interlocking to try and prevent human errors um, occurring. But what I just described about a signal wire is designed to fail safe in that if the wire snaps, it goes saggy, the signal will put itself back to danger, regardless of the position of the lever the other end. And it's easy to see that that's, that's much more preferable than an occasion where if the wire snaps, the signal moves itself into the clear position and a driver obeys that signal when it's not actually clear to go. Um, electric cables, for the transmission of electricity, obviously. Um, and then some more sort of technical things, which I'll, I'll concentrate more on a little bit later, but these things called remote control links, where we can control interlocking that's far away. And then almost up to the present day, this solid state interlocking network, um, which is the sort of the most recent of uh, transmission developments. And no matter which combination of those that you choose, it always then goes to some trackside equipment, which primarily is signals, points, and track circuits. They're the three key parts. There are other parts, but they're the three key parts of trackside equipment that we're either controlling and or getting inputs back from. So that's, um, that's the bit where the where the signaler, the signaling designers, and then and then the people like like me as a track engineer start bumping into each other, and we you know that's where I need to start attaching useful stuff onto the track, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes. And I'm not sure if everyone's familiar. Um, and incidentally, I'm going to try to deliberately not overlap with things that Melanie said in her video here. This is why I'm, I'm concentrating on the, the signalers interface. Yep. But just in case anyone's not aware, track circuit in less than 30 seconds is a current passing through the rails that proves there is no train there. And when a train comes along and shorts out the two rails, that is a path of less resistance for the current to flow through. So it doesn't flow through the length of the rails. And that advises the signaling system that there is something on that bit of track. Could be a train, could be a metal bar, could be a track circuit operating clip, could be any number of things. But the purpose of a track circuit is to prove a, set of, a section of track is clear. And if it can't do that, 
we assume that it's occupied. And then last but not least, the train driver. He's the person who, uh, who drives the train, obeys the signals, and in doing so, in moving that train around, gives input back to the signaling system. Yeah, so you've got you've got a driver and there, yeah, so you, you've got a signaler at one end and then you've got a driver at the other end and they... Um, and, and their their path of communication uh, is is sort of in the flowchart, which I've scribbled all over. In fact, I can get rid of yeah, all my scribbles right. by this magic button. Um, and and there you go, like, yeah. It is a soft, squishy human at both ends of all that technology. And, and 200 years, nearly, of railway signaling technology development is in between those two people um, trying to write out the possibility of any accident of the past being rewritten. But ultimately, a person presses the buttons at one end and a person obeys what comes out the other end. Yeah. So um so yeah we'll we'll revisit that again at the end I think once we've had our mm. once we kind of discussed the various bits but that, I think that neatly neatly uh, neatly lays it out there um uh, thanks for right. thanks, so um so we're going to kick off uh, by talking about I think you, you it makes sense I mean start I suppose at the beginning which is with uh, mechanical lever frames um and so here is some of those <laughs> which I think yeah. I think probably most people watching will be familiar with this imagery if not necessarily the the kind of the the, the, the bits and pieces underneath and behind. But th th these are quite familiar images, I would say. If you describe signalling, uh, this is what people think of. Yes, absolutely, yes. And this is technology as old as railways, almost. Um, there was a period, of course, before um, the idea of concentrating all the levers into one building with a roof on it and interlocking them together came about, but it was, it was fairly early on. Um, and I don't propose to make this a, a complete history of everything that's ever happened in, in signalling. As you say, we'll concentrate on mechanical frames, panels and VDUs and all those other things that were in that flow chart will sort of crop up naturally because developments in all of those things spur developments in all the others. So it's not a straightforward timeline. But this is two mechanical boxes. The one on the top right is in preservation. It's called Exeter West uh, and it's at Crew Heritage Centre, believe it or not. But it was until 1985 at the west end of Exeter St. David Station. Uh, and it, it was moved very similar to how you described for Borough Market Junction. Um, to, to various places until it found its home at Exeter West. And it's an absolutely humongous uh, mechanical lever frame. It's got 131 levers. And that's the reason I included it, because it's a particularly massive example. I can't quite see on my screen. I don't know if you can see the number of the lever nearest to the frame, but I guess that's got to be up in the hundreds. Hundred and, so this says 125, this one, and that's mm. not the last one. There's another, clearly another, there's clearly Love another six. lever yeah. sort of here. It's 126. So that's quite a lot of levers, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Spectacular. Yes. Uh, um, that's, signalers must absolutely love getting in there and having a, and having a play. It's quite Yeah, no, I think people really do. Yes, absolutely. And I'll talk about the colours and the instruments and things in a second. But if we just come over to the other picture, that's Beerley West Junction, which only closed a few years ago. That's just outside Stratford-on-Avon. Um, and it's another mechanical lever frame, but you can see it's a completely different type. The, the levers are a different shape and the angle is different. Um, and it was just to illustrate, really, that there are loads of different types of mechanical lever frame and there's going to be loads of different types of panel, loads of different types of VDU signaling system made by different railway companies, made by different manufacturers. But I'd say 95 percent of the, the functionality is the same. Um, so, uh, again, if you're not already uh, familiar, there's a color coordination scheme uh, to the levers, uh, which you can see, but I can't because it comes out black and white for me. Oh, really? Uh, That's very strange. Sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. So we've got, we, yeah, I mean, you can see the majority are red. Uh, yes. So that's probably not a bad so, color to start with. That's right. Yeah. So the red levers are connected to signals. They're ones that will predominantly have a, a steel wire on the end of them, like I described a minute ago. When the lever is sort of away from you, as most of those levers are, and that's called the normal position, the, le the signal will be at its most restrictive. And when you pull the lever towards you to what it's called its reverse position, that will tension the wire and pull the signal either up or down. Yeah. Um, so now, we actually have, sorry to interrupt, we've got a very interesting question on that front, which I thought what I, I was waiting to ask when we got to, to wire tensions. And, and maybe you're going to answer this, but an interesting question, I think, which might have been from John Christoph, if it isn't, sorry, um, which was uh, how far can those wire runs actually go before the, 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 the stretch in the cable becomes impractical to operate uh, uh, a signal? Well, it's more that the weight of the cable becomes impractical it's, ah. and it's changed throughout time, but generally a thousand yards. Okay, it's okay, yeah. less if it's very curvy track, because obviously there's lots of friction for the wire mm. to go through lots of pulleys going around the corners. Um, there, there's lots of other uh, factors, but generally a thousand yards for, for a signal. 
Sure. Um, and and it, as it's mainly due to shifting all that weight because you've only got the strength of your arms to pull these levers. See, yeah. they're really quite thought... long, so you get a lot of mechanical advantage, but much that's... more than a thousand yards, and you really have to give it some welly uh, to, to come off. Ah, that's very interesting. You might notice in, in the bottom left picture, on the right-hand side of it, you can see a little black stalk with a little handle on the top. Can you see yeah, that? This, this thing here that I've yeah. boxed that's numbered 28, yeah, that's in it. fact. And that's a wire adjuster, and ah. that's for taking some slack out of the wire on hot days when the steel expands, and you can only pull the lever the same amount... But if the wire is expanded and it's longer, there's not going to be the same amount of travel at the other end of it, at the signal end. So you can take some of the slack out when the sun comes out and then you can wind it back off again in the evening. You'd never you'd struggle to wind it off so much that you actually affected the signal. But that's what that is for, for the for the expansion of the wire in hot weather. That's yeah, fascinating. That, that was essentially my next thought on question was, yeah, I mean, thermal variation, something that that, that track people have to deal with. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, signalers as well. That's that's, Fascinating, yeah, okay. Um, so so colour-wise, yeah, so we did red. What's the next yeah. colour you'd like to point out? Black is probably the next most uh, popular colour, mm. and black is sets of points. Ah, okay, yeah. So sets of points, as I'm sure you'll be aware, the rails in the points literally move from side to side, or you'll definitely be aware, Gareth, but, you know, the people, <laughs> that the point blades literally have to move from side to side, and they're quite heavy, and you couldn't just pull them in one direction and then let a tension in the wire pull them the other direction. So where you have points, it's not a wire, it's a solid rod. And when you're, you're pulling the lever, you're pulling the, uh, the rod. And when you're pushing it, you're pushing it. So it's, it's sort of retarded in both directions. Yeah. Now, that also has problems with um, expansion and contraction. But you can change along the, um, the rodding run whether the rodding is in tension or compression by use of bell cranks where it goes around corners or a special device called a compensator that works a bit like that. Ah, okay. And you have to make sure that exactly half of the rodding run is in tension and exactly half of it is in compression. Because then if it expands, there'll be no net difference. And if it contracts, there'll be no net difference. There's no opportunity to adjust rodding. Uh, see, yeah, there we go. So that's yeah, so that answers a few question, queries that were popping up. So that's that's good. Yeah, oh, okay. Brilliant. And again, uh, the set of points will have a normal and a reverse position. So, And it's not always the straight route that's normal. Mm. Quite often it is, but it's not always. You can't guarantee. And when the lever is away from you in the normal position in the frame, the points are normal. And when you pull it towards you, the points are reverse. There we go. So uh, so that's red and black. I've written yep. in my dreadful handwriting. I've been annotating. I'm John Maddening the heck out of this. Um, uh -huh. So the next colour, there are still blue. a few options. The next colour is, is blue you want to go into. Mm. Yeah, so okay. blue are locks um, and facing points, which is ones where as the train approaches them, it can go either way. It has a choice. As to, well, obviously, the signalman has the choice as to which way the train is going to go. Obviously, there's a real danger that if the point blades aren't fully one side or the other, the wheels of the train will go down both sides and derail. And I'm sure we've all had that on our model railways where the train derails because the points aren't properly set. Obviously, you can't have that on a, on a full size railway. So in the bar that attaches those two point blades to each other, which is called the stretcher bar, there'll be a notch or in most cases two notches, but sometimes only one. And the notch is in exactly the right place that the lock can poke into it only when it's moved the full extent of its travel. If it only moves halfway, the lock won't be able to move in. And as we're going to talk about at great length, all these mechanical levers are locked together. So if you move the points and then you try and move the lock and the lock can't engage, you won't get the lever all the way over. And that will stop you then operating the signal lever. And again, it's this fail safe. You've got to move the points and then you've got a lock. cascade them. of protection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. You can't say we'll clear the signal now and we'll set the points before the train gets there. You've got to set the points now and then lock them. And only then can the train be given permission to go. Now, uh, again, because I can't see the colours, you might oh. find... So, so, so we've got some blue ones here, um, but there are also... So um, there's, there's yellow. Yellow is the last solid colour that I can spot. Yeah. Um, right. So there's, there's a yellow one. So a yellow is another type of signal. And remember, red was signals, but red is a specific type of signal. It's stop signals. It's signals that you can expect a train to stop at. Uh, there are other types of signals. There are called distant signals in this context, which only give the driver information about signals ahead. They're not ones at which you can expect the train to stop. So yellow levers are distant uh, signal levers, whereas red levers are stop signal levers, which could be main main aspect or main arm stop signals, or it could be little uh, shunting signals. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, 
Ah, okay. Now, so, we also have some patterned, so there's some white and black chevron sort of striped ones, and there's some ones that have, I think they look, almost looks like one with a blue top, a white, and then a black, there, there are a few different there's colour loads patterns. There's combinations, and, yeah. yeah. So, the, the chevron ones, the black and white ones, they are detonator placer levers, and you may have discussed in one of your other videos, detonators, little things about the size of a biscuit that you clip onto the top of the rails, and if a train runs over them, it makes a big noise that can be heard over the noise of an engine. So even if the driver doesn't happen to be looking out, and particularly when you think of a steam engine, which is where this all originated, um, they can hear the noise, and it's, it's like the last chance emergency signal to stop if you hear the, the noise. Um, and in some signal boxes, levers were provided to place those on and off the rails, either in an emergency ah. or as part of other planned protection uh, work. I didn't know that. That's so, fascinating. Yeah. And the chevrons point downwards if it's on a down line and upwards if it's on an up line. Because if it's something that you need to go for in an emergency, it's quite helpful to have that visual clue as to which, yeah. of, the, which of the levers it is. Um, now, Exeter West has got some peculiarities because it was a really complicated, really decent box. And that's why it was the one that was preserved, which I won't go into now. Um, but in in the 99.9% .9 of cases, they were only used in emergencies. I see. Now, there is some eagle-eyed viewers have pointed out there is a single uh, solid color that I missed. And this is partly because... Um, I kind of uh, maybe instinctively missed it because it's it's the white ones now, which I believe oh. are uh, levers not actually in use at that point. That's right. I think yeah. that's correct. Spare yeah. ones. Yeah. Spares. And in early days, certainly on the Great Western, and I have to say I, that's where I come from and what most of my research is in, um, they didn't have spares. They took the lever out. Ah, and that's really? why in, in the right-hand picture you can see there are some gaps. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Not very yeah. easily. You can just about make them out. Um, because they didn't have spares, they took them out. Oh, and as time went on, and obviously the railways were taking out a lot more stuff than they put in, the practice came to an end and they just started painting them white. Whereas other regions, in some cases, provided them from new, um, you know, in order to allow for future, mm. f future things to be installed. Uh, passive provision in, in action, folks, <laughs> in some mm. cases. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so, um, I mean, these are both very... So, so we have... Already the chat is nerding out, and we had someone, in fact, it's run off. So we had someone pointing out, I mean, hopefully many people in the chat should know that the currently largest operating mechanical signal box, and I hope this is right, I hope this isn't a QI klaxon moment, uh, is um, is Severn Junction, as in the Shrewsbury one. Like the Shrewsbury so, one is the, is the largest at the moment, which I believe had had 180 levers, but only 90 are currently in operation. Does that right. sound right? I, I, I it can't. certainly sounds right, yes. yes. There's a very interesting discussion that we don't need to have now about how you measure which one is the biggest. Because uh, uh, obviously number of levers is a good option, but not every lever is present. So do you only count the levers that are present or all of them? Do you count the spaces? Not uh, all of the signal boxes have levers that are evenly spaced. So on that top right-hand uh, picture, they're at four-inch centers. I don't know what they are in the bottom left, but it's certainly wider than four. It might yeah, be four yeah. and a half or five. So you could have a frame with a smaller number of levers, but is actually a longer... Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to really argue about what... Yeah, that's yeah, what you mean, yeah. And, and, and then, so what I found interesting and I didn't realize... Uh, was that my local that, that local to me and and you may correct this possibly David Bumstead this seriously nerdy good work um, York Loco Yard uh, had uh, apparently was the biggest ever with two hundred and ninety five levers um, wow which is that's mind blowing that's given the size of what we're looking at with a hundred with with the number here one hundred and uh, one hundred twenty six at minimum here at the extra one we have the that, that I mean that's huge so two hundred and ninety five <laughs> must be enormous yeah <laughs> definitely and I bet it was worked by several people at the same time as well yeah I was going to say you have to have multiple signalers on 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 duty at that point uh, and it starts looking like a modern air traffic control kind of uh, centre mm. at that point with people bouncing around each other fascinating so right i mean we've already so, this we knew this yeah. would happen we could talk for hours on just one slide there's so much interesting here well there's a couple of other points that i'd really like to make mm, yes yeah, uh, it's the um the icons in the bottom right hand side are there for a deliberate reason um and that is just to underline in fact something that i said earlier which is not to assume that just because it's a mechanical frame it must be controlling mechanical signals mechanical frame can control color lights no problem at all um 
And I should point out that the picture of the colour light that you've just put an arrow to comes off the Rail Signs website, just to give them a plug. Yeah, it's a uh, fantastic which website has... that I use in my day job quite regularly. So, yeah, big, big plug to them. Yeah, excellent history of how signalling or signals themselves have developed ever since the beginning of railways. Um, and markers and all sorts. If there's a, if there's a sign yeah. or a thing on the railway network that you're not sure what it is, you know, a sign or something visual, um, that... That, that website is genuinely fantastic and, and is kept up to date. I, I hope that they have a plan for continuing to keep it up to date because it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource. It really is a really, really powerful resource for, um, for, for me and my day job as a railway engineer. So, uh, yeah, uh, really good stuff. F go and support them if you can. And then the only other thing to touch on um, so that we don't ignore it completely is above the lever frame. There's a whole load of stuff above the lever frame. Mm. I'm not going to go to everything in one go, but key points are you can see in the Exeter West picture, there's a great big diagram at the top. So every signal box, no matter whether it's a mechanical frame or a panel or a VDU system or whatever, it will have a diagram of all the area it controls and all of the um, equipment that's on it, all, all the points, all the signals, and what number they are, so you know what number lever or what number button it is to operate them. And that's really important. The diagram is an absolutely key part of the, um, uh, the signal and equipment. Some boxes were so big that they had more than one diagram. They had duplicate diagrams so that you could mm. see it no matter where you were uh, in the signal box. And some regions were more generous at providing them than others. And unfortunately, the Great Western certainly wasn't very generous at all. Oh, <laughs> really? But I'd say um, there's another. So there's another here, actually, just as, as you say, so that every, every yes. box. Yeah. Well, that has snuck in, really. The diagram for Bailey is off the top of the picture. Ah, that's okay. the panel that's that the panel. snuck into this part of the talk so for a the a yeah. So there's sort of two signal boxes in one here. There's the, uh, there's the mechanical frame, which was Bailey West Junction. And then the next box in one of the three directions um, at Stratford upon Avon was closed, and it was just put on a little panel in here. But oh, we'll pretend okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then ah, between right. the diagram and the levers, there's what's called the block shelf, and that has on it um, all of the visual indications, all of the instruments, and all of the communications equipment like block bells and telephones um, that that supplement the lever frame. It can't or, or Apart from the very earliest ones, it's, it's not much good just on its own as a lever frame. So the, the one, I won't go through them all, but for example, in the Exeter West photo, the extreme right-hand one, that's a lamp repeater that shows whether an oil lamp in a signal is burning or out. Obviously, that's really important because yeah. at night, if the lamp is out, it doesn't matter how much the signal is at danger, the driver can't see it, you won't know to stop there. Uh, the next one over, for example, is a train ready to start indicator for all the platforms at St. David's. You press a button on the platform and, and that would buzz to let the signalman know that the train is ready to go. Um, you can see just under the telephone, uh, sorry, the TRTS instrument, um, there's some little black and white round, um, there's two under the telephone instrument, uh, signal repeaters, and they have a little mechanical needle in that moves from side to side to say whether the signal is on, which means at its most restrictive, or off, which means anything other than its most restrictive. Because it's really important that as the signalman pulls the lever to operate the signal, that the signal does actually uh, respond, that the equipment hasn't failed. So in ge generally, you'll either be able to see the signal out the window, or it'll have a repeater like that um, to tell you what it's doing, uh, so that you know it has responded correctly. Actually. Yeah, so the driver, um, the, the driver can see that, and they can. Uh, so, uh, the driver, so the, the signaller is is confident that the driver is seeing what they what they need to be seeing. Exactly. Yes. And in between those two uh, little buttons, and four of them to the right of those two repeaters, they are buttons that you press, and that's because as well as mechanical locking being on this frame to stop you pulling illegal combinations of levers, there's also electrical locking. Um, so things that we can interlock with that aren't just this lever frame. We can interlock with track circuits that we talked about a moment ago so that we can't pull a lever to clear a signal if the bit of line ahead of the signal has already got a train on it. Or there are some interlocking functions that, um, that are easier to achieve electrically than mechanically. So the purpose of the button is so that you're not draining all the batteries picking up the electric lever locks the whole time you press the button just before you want to pull the lever and if it can it will pick up the electric lock and again fail safe so it takes electromagnetism to pull that lock up against gravity to get it out of the slide tappet that we'll come to in a minute if the power fails if the battery fails if the wire fails if you don't press the button any of those scenarios the lock will be in naturally and you won't be able to pull it out again 
There you go. And so, the, and, and you can see these disappearing off down, huge numbers of these, of the indicators and the locks all the way disappearing off down. Lots and lots of That's right, yeah. And you can see them in Beerley West as well. There's some other things. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side of Beerley West Junction, there's a mechanical signal repeater. The one to the left of it is just a different type. It's more of a Midland one for a signal that goes up. That Instead of a needle swinging from side to side, there's a picture of a signal that moves up. And the, the white box will be to do with axle counter resets. There will just be little number readouts so that you don't find people pressing the button more often than they should. You get a number every time. And the next one over to the left of that, those are colour light signal repeaters. So they are just a, a box with a light in it that comes on when the signal is showing that colour. That's the one, yeah. Uh, again, so that you can prove that the signal has obeyed um, what, what you've, you've required it to do. And in there is not just that the signal is at that position, but that the, the light is actually lit. We can prove when a bulb is burning. Um, so if the bulb fails, the signaling system will know about it. There we go. Right, so... I mean, the, uh, this is probably useful because this—I I dare say—this will now provide the, the 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 backfill for everything else that we now see because broadly we're replicating this functionality right through the to the succeeding yeah. generations. Absolutely, and that's another reason why it's not a fixed relationship between the interface and the interlocking and the trackside equipment because it's all following the same principle. There are some permutations that you just can't have, but there are plenty of mechanical lever frames that control color lights. There are examples of panels, not very many, but panels that control semaphores um, that you, you can you can mix and match it almost however you want. So uh, we should probably, given we're, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm pleased and knew this would happen and I don't mind, but we are already 42 minutes in. So <laughs> that's, right. that's good. So we've so that was uh, mechanical lever frames. I think yeah. it's in some detail. Uh, next is mechanical interlocking. So, yes. and here we have some images of mechanical interlocking. Now, uh, there are some letters that are going to appear. Um, and so the first letter that's going to appear is letter A. Um, oh, right. I see. Okay. Okay. Well, again, many different types of mechanical interlocking. Uh, this is my favorite type. This is five bar vertical tappet uh, locking. There are many different manufacturers and many different railway companies that make it, but this is my favorite. So we're underneath the signal box now. We're in the room underneath, not in the operating room upstairs. We're in the sort of the ground floor and the levers are above us. And where A is, is in this particular design, and as I say, there's many different designs, but in this particular design, uh, there's a set of cams. And when a lever is operated upstairs, when the signalman pulls the lever towards him, that cam will shoot out of that box. And you can see just to the left of the A, there's one, two close together that are in the reverse position. And all the ones to the right of the A, you can see that that cam plate is, is in the box and the lever is normal. Yeah. So if I just, and, so you can see the, the level difference here, right? This is this is what you're talking about. Uh, is that right? So that there's there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, well, you, you have got it exactly right, but I was actually talking about directly to the left of the A, you can see there's a, a plate with a slot in it that is much further out than the ones ah, to the right. Oh, of these. Ah, I see. Forgive me. Yes. That's it. These, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. But ah, you're absolutely right. right in what you said, because you'll notice that there's a slot cut in that plate and there's a pin that goes through that slot, which is connected to those vertical tappet bars, which if you can show B, please. Yes, I can do that. There we are. There's B. Yep. So, there's, so all those vertical tappet bars are all connected to those cam plates. And because that slot has got an angle that you can see at the end, and it's got another angle that you can't see at the other end, at the extreme ends of the stroke of the lever, the, the tappet blade, the B, will be moved up and down in two sets of movements it'll start and it'll go halfway and then when the lever's fully reversed it'll go the rest of the way and when it goes back to normal it'll move to the middle the moment you take it out of reverse and you can do the complete stroke of the lever last thing when you put it to normal it'll it'll go fully into the normal end of its travel so yes what you where you put those little arrows you found a, a very detailed uh uh difference in the height of the tappet blades there it's exactly right it's because yeah. those levers reverse the tappet has moved downwards by what's that an inch or, or just two inches or, or or there thereabouts. Yes, but what I've missed because it's a little bit dark. I should have I should have uh, mm. adjusted the image slightly. Is these you can just about see them, everyone? Uh, is these is these larger bars that are stuck out, uh, which are uh, kind of there, which I've kind of outlined in red just for a bit of clarity. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. So 
Uh, That's it. As I say, not all lever frames have them. There are many different types of arranging this, but I thought I'd just concentrate on one, and obviously I picked my favourite. <laughs> of course. So as the levers move normal and reverse, the tappet blades, B, move up and down. And if you wouldn't mind showing C, please. There we are. And where C, so I couldn't put the actual C on the thing, but I've drawn an arrow. So you can see where C points to, and you can see it even more in the sort of the inset version, is the tappet blades have notches cut out of them. And they're sort of beveled on both sides. And you can see that there's a lump of brass uh, called a lock nib or a lock dog that has mated with that um, uh, notch. That's it, exactly there. And the lock dog is connected to the horizontal bar that, it, that is, is directly above it. And as that tappet blade moves down, the bevel edge on the notch will force the lock dog to the right. It's not connect. That's it. Yeah, it's not connected to the vertical one. The vertical one is just there to hold everything in, so it doesn't just ah, all okay. fall out. Yeah. So the vertical one you can you can ignore. So this is the so one. So this goes down. That's uh, it. Yeah. This that then force that that, that force here pushes this thing, pushes that's that it. The bevel thing, pushes it that yeah. way. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. So, if we imagine another, a, a complete mirror image of that on another lever, um, we can either allow or obstruct the horizontal movement of that lock dog. And if we obstruct it, the tappet can't move down. And if the tappet can't move down, the cam bar can't come out. And if the cam bar can't come out, the lever can't be moved. So the signalman will be upstairs trying to pull the lever and it'll be that lock dog, the inability of that lock dog to move to the right in this particular set of circumstances that stops him or her operating that lever. And this is called tappet locking and it's been around for a very long time. It's really effective. I think that this five bar stuff and instantly it's called five bars because you can get five bars in each sort of line of the interlocking. So it's really space efficient. There was three bar and other stuff. Um, that, that's what it's all based on and you can do all sorts of uh, wonderful uh, logical operations computing operations um, using this tappet locking so whenever you're ready unless there's any more points no, I was going to say so, so then we've got D which appears here which uh... oh I forgot about D so D sorry yes that <laughs> is... D is on the horizontal um, bridles that connects the lock dogs together um... and there might be well any number of two or more um, on each. Oh, no, you can have one, actually. Sorry, I've just thought of a circumstance where you could have one. Um, but there will be a number of lock dogs attached to each horizontal uh, bar, and they move from left to right if they can. <clears throat> never up and down. Well, I say never. You should. I should learn. Never say never in the railway. There will be an yeah, there's some strange there's some exception. Yeah, <laughs> really complicated logical operation is required to be done, and I'm sure there is some somewhere that can move up and down. But for the sake of this, they can only move from left to right. And the tappet blades can only move up and down. And, and uh, ah, so um, I was just checking there wasn't yeah. an E there. So oh. uh, we have an interesting question from uh, actually John Christoph again saying, why is it called a dog? Well, my response to that is because almost everything's called it. There's always something called a dog. I think it, I it, anything that's got a funny shape, we call it a dog. You know, you've got timber dogs for lifting sleepers around and sort of uh. all sorts of funny names for things that always involve the word dog. But yeah, someone else came in. Adrian's coming. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Adrian's dropped in and said... Um, it's just an engineering term for, for, for something that uh, yeah prevents movement or imparts movement by offering physical obstruction. So there you go. Well, that's exactly what it does. Indeed. Yeah. Lovely. So right now we're okay, getting so into the diagrammatic part. Yes, and I went to great lengths drawing all these in my favorite CAD design package of PowerPoint. Absolutely. It's what I rely as lots of people in the chat currently will know, it's also my graphics design package of choice. So uh, yeah, right with you on that. Right. I can't see the colors, I'm afraid. So is it green for one and orange so, for two? So uh, number that... two is green, number one is yellow. Okay. Right. Oh, I'm sorry you can't see so the I colors. Did... That's very strange. No, that's all right. Um, so I'm going to call it orange and green. Um, ah, yes, and okay. I deliberately picked colors that aren't general use lever colors. Again, there'll be an example somewhere. And there certainly was examples of green levers in history, but I've deliberately detached this part of the demonstration from anything to do with lever colours. But we've got two levers here, number one and number two, and um, uh, they're going to be locked, interlocked together using this uh, tappet system that we just described. And what we're going to achieve is that one and two 
are mutually exclusive. So if you if you reverse lever one, you can't reverse lever two. And if you reverse lever two, you can't reverse lever one. Therefore, it follows that you cannot have one and two reverse at the same time. So the orange and green is the tappet blades that can only move up and down. And the red is the is the lock dogs and they are physically connected together by that sort of dumbbell shape they can if they if one moves the other moves they can't get closer together than they are shown on the um, on the drawing uh, but they can shuffle from left to right so in step one both of the levers are normal both of the tappet blades are at the top it just so happens that the lock dog is engaged in lever number one but it's completely free to move left and right because you can see there's plenty of space for it to move into the notch on lever two that's it and in step two we've reversed lever number two so the tappet has moved quite considerably further than it would in real life down the page it's now reverse and you can see that the notch no longer lines up with where the dog is so it is now impossible for that lock dog to move to the right into lever number two because the notch no longer lines up. You'll also notice that the notch only lines up when it is exactly normal. Sometimes you want it anything that's not one millimeter away from normal or anything that's anything but reverse or any combination you want. You can make the notch taller and longer. But in this case, that lock dog can only move into lever number two when that tappet blade is fully at the very top. And that's how we want our signaling to operate. We don't want any sloppiness. It's when we're definitely normal and then we can move lever one. So hopefully you'll agree that in step two, those locks are now absolutely fixed in position. And therefore, it would be impossible for tappet number one to move downwards because it couldn't push the lock dogs over. And therefore, it's impossible to pull lever number one. So what we've achieved here is that if you pull two, you can't pull one. In step three, I've put lever number two back to normal. Step three is exactly the same as step one. Tappet number two has gone all the way up to the top. The green tappet is all the way at the top. The locks are now free to move left and right again if they want to. They stay in the last position that they're sort of set to. They're not sprung or anything. Well, sometimes they are sprung, but these ones are not sprung. Um, so because lever number two was the last one to move, the locks are still over on the left hand side. Now I'm going to try and pull lever number one. I'm going to try and push that tappet blade downwards. And because the lock and the tappet blade have both got that diagonal beveled edge on them, as soon as I start moving lever number one and the tappet starts moving downwards, it will force the lock over to the right. And as soon as it starts forcing it over to the right, it engages with the notch in lever number two. And then I can't pull lever number two. So I can't even be clever and try and pull them both at the same time or anything like that. I wouldn't get either of them if I tried to pull them both at the same time because both locks would be trying to move in. Uh, so what I've achieved here is number one locks number two. And the great thing about this mechanical tappet locking is everything is reciprocal. If you achieve one locks two, you've also achieved two locks one. There are other tricks that you can pull to make it non-reciprocal. But again, for the sake of this, it's reciprocal. So the locking here could be applied to that diagram in the bottom right hand corner. And this is what a signaling diagram looks like, apart from the pictures of the trains, which I put on. So where there's two parallel lines, that represents a track. And where they join almost together, that represents a set of points. And they're always shown on the signaling diagram in the normal position, the position the points are in when they are in the, nor the levers in the normal position of the frame. So if now that train on the right hand side, at signal number two was to move forward, it would take the left hand route. It wouldn't crash into the other train. If we reversed the points, it would take the right hand route and it would be face to face with the other train. So although I haven't bothered numbering the points just for the sake of this demonstration, I've numbered the two signals, one and two, and you can see that it would never be safe to clear signals one and two at the same time because the trains will, will conflict with each other. There's loads of other locking that we would have on even a very simple layout like this, but that tappet locking will work perfectly well for making signal one and signal two mutually exclusive with each other so that you can only clear uh, one at a time. Um, and that is summarized in that text on the left hand side to move lever one to reverse requires two to be normal to move two to reverse requires one to be normal. Therefore, one and two are mutually exclusive. And how we would word that in in railway terminology is we'd say one requires two normal. And we wouldn't actually say two requires one normal because it goes without saying because mechanical locking is reciprocal unless you do something to make it not so. But we'll say here that two requires one normal and for normal.
Does that make sense? It does. I, I just want to point out, which I, hopefully you'll enjoy, is um, that uh, where uh, Tommy Lucas, hello Tommy, uh, wants to point oh. out that they they're loving the fact that the font used here um, is uh, bears a close resemblance to the text in old mechanical signal engineering documents. So it's a good job we uh, we did keep this in it after all, uh, Danny. That's uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. That wasn't accidental. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think that's quite clear. Should we, uh, should we hop to the next one? Yeah, so we'll go to the next one. Yeah. So this is a little bit different because in the last one, it was uh, mutually exclusive. One requires two normal, two requires one normal. This time, we're going to say that one requires two reverse. You've got to pull two before you can pull one. So let's look at the diagram first. This time, I've numbered the signal and the point. If we were to clear signal number one and that little flag symbol that looks a bit like a signal, that is the symbol for a signal, that's the one, yeah. If we were able to clear that signal and allow the train to move while the points were in the position they are at the moment, the points would be damaged because the blades are not in the right position. The wheels of the train would force the blades over. There'd be what's called run through. It's not safe at all at the moment for signal number one to be cleared. We want to force that the signalman, yeah, unsmiley face, yeah. Uh, reverses the points so that they're the other way to the way they're drawn and only then can signal number one be cleared. So in step one, both the levers are normal and you can see the notch in lever two is in a different position in this example. Yeah, I'll, flick, I'll flick between the, pre just so people can see, I'll yeah, flick between the two it. slides to sort of show you the different notch position. There you go, everyone. So that's you can it. see this new position of notch. I can try and pull lever number one. But if I try and move that tap it down, those lock dogs are going to try and move over to the right. They're not going to be able to go into a notch in lever number two because it's not in the right place. So I'm not going to be able to move lever number one. And at the moment, lever number one is locked. So I'll move lever number two, which is what I've done in step two. The tap it's moved downwards. It was completely free to move. There was nothing obstructing it. And now once it's completely completed its travel, not just halfway, but completely all the way, the notch you can see easily now lines up with the lock dog which means that in step three, now I've probably not done the best explanation here because I was trying to show that the lock dog can move if it wants to uh, when it's forced by lever number one over to the right. It wouldn't have moved by itself until you start moving lever number ones. So the drawing isn't quite 100%, but I just wanted to show that it's now completely free to, to move from left to right it wouldn't actually start moving until tappet number one started moving downwards and the bevel edges forced it over. That's it. And in step four, you can see I've now moved lever number one to reverse all the way down. It's pushed the lock over to the right and it's engaged with the, with the notch uh, in lever number two. And now, uh, because I move lever number two first, the points are reverse. It's then safe for me to move number one, which I have done. Is it safe for me to now put the points back to normal? Now I've cleared the signal. Uh, no. No is the correct answer. Because this is locked and it's quite in, good right? Because the locking is reciprocal. If I tried to move tappet number two back up now, those locks would not be able to move over to the left because there's no notch in lever number one. So now that I've cleared the signal, it's locking the points in position or it's locking the lever of the points in position for me. I can't accidentally, now that I've basically told the driver it's okay to move, now change my mind on the position of the points. Mechanical locking is reciprocal. It's brilliant. I uh, love this. So, so lots of very pleased people in the chat enjoying the simplicity and elegance of this good. of this form of, of lock. And also others saying this is, it reminds people of and, or, and not gates. Well, signaling exactly is a series of logic puzzles, right? Exactly what it is. Um, uh, so uh, to cut right to the end of the text, uh, how we word it is one requires two R, one requires two reverse. That's the logic is you can only have one if two is already reverse. Um, the second part of that, there's a new term here, one backlocks two. Backlock is used in, in a number of different ways in locking, but in this case, it means that once you've pulled one, two cannot be moved back. It cannot be moved back to normal, so it's backlocked. As I say, there are other different uses of the word backlock, but in this case, that's what, uh, that's what we're talking about. And there we go. That's... Wonderful. I mean, that's a fantastic explanation. A really nice, clear explanation. I love that. Um, yeah. So that. So okay. So yeah. Lots of people enjoying the elegance of this in the chat. I'm glad you all are. Um, so, 
Uh, it's oh, also yes. It's already eight o'clock. Thanks, every. I mean, this this will this will go up. So if you're worrying about disappearing off, don't worry. This is saved. We've had Owen. The signal um, has has dropped off. Uh, don't worry, Owen. This this will save, so you can catch up with it later. Don't worry. Um, so, stick. How with many us. people are watching it? Can you go? Oh yeah, I can tell you. Ninety people are currently watching and enjoying this, oh, and then nice. and then we'll normally get between one or two thousand who'll watch it within the next sort of uh, couple of weeks. So yeah. Okay. Uh, there you go. Is Not it? Yes, hello to everyone. So, right. Uh, right. Right, anyway, we shall we shall press ahead. Okay. So the next right, slide. Right, so slightly more complicated example now, but it's exactly the same principle. So in the previous example, we only had two locks and they were fixed in position to each other. Now we've got five. They're all still fixed in position to each other. They can all still only move left and right when all of the locks can move into notches. None of the locks can move in relation to each other. I think, did I color it red? Yeah, so so the the notches yep. are, are red. The, the the one at the end here, this last one is dark red, uh, and That's uh, okay. Uh, well, tap it. But anyway, yeah. So the the the. So I try to color things in that are fixed in relation to each other. So each of those tappets is a different color. They can all be yep. moved by levers separately, but the lock is all one thing. Um, yes. So it can only move all of it left or all of it right. Yeah. So let's go through this and we'll go from left to right. Uh, so lever number one currently has the, 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 uh, the lock dog engaged. So lever number one is either locked at the moment or if it's free, that lock needs to be able to move over to the right. But we can immediately see by looking at lever number two that it cannot move over to the right because the, the, the notch is in the wrong place on lever number two, that's right. So lever number one therefore is definitely locked at the moment because the lock cannot move over. Lever number two is free to move. There's nothing stopping lever number two moving at the moment. Lever number three, exactly the same story. In fact, if you notice, two, three, and four are all identical copies of each other. So all of those notches that you've just drawn circles around would all independently have to be moved down. All the levers would have to be moved to reverse in order to put slots, and I haven't got a step-by-step -step plan for this one, I'm afraid, in order to put slots in the right places for all those locks to move over to the right in sympathy with lever number one being reversed. Number five is a little bit different because number five, the notch, sorry, the, yeah, the notch is currently in the right place. So that uh, lock, if it wasn't uh, prevented from doing so by two, three, and four, could move into the notch in lever number five but if we were to move lever number five to reverse, for example, then obviously it would no longer line up and it wouldn't. It wouldn't be able to move. So the sum total of all this is lever number one. In order to move lever number one to reverse, we've got to have two reverse, three reverse, four reverse, and five normal. That's the only combination of two, three, four, and five that will allow all those five locks to move over to the right and therefore lever number one to move to reverse. You get every reciprocal permutation for free. Once you've pulled two, three, four, and not five, and then you pull one, two is backlocked by one, three is backlocked by one, four is backlocked by one, five is locked by one. One and five are mutually exclusive. If you notice, if you hold your hand over two, three, and four, what you're left with is example one, is one and five are mutually exclusive. Uh, yeah. So this exactly works for the diagram below. There's a signal, number one, over the right-hand side. And there's three sets of points and the destination that we're going for is where it says destination. And remember that how the diagram is drawn is how the points lay uh, when the lever is normal. So we want points number five to be in the position they are in. Otherwise, we're going to take a left turn and go off the bottom of the page. We want lever number three to be the opposite to the way it is at the moment, the opposite to normal. We want it to be reverse in order that we can turn right. And the same with points number two. We need those to be reversed as well in order to get to the destination that we're aiming for. In order to make the demo work, I've included number four, which is how on some types of diagram a lock is shown. Remember we said about facing point locks? That's one way of a number of ways of showing a lock. And sometimes in some installations, um, the points are locked when the lever is normal and sometimes when it's reversed. There's, there's different uh, circumstances where you'd require one or the other. But in this case, the lever is uh, the points are locked when the lever is reverse. So you can see it works out perfectly. We need two reverse, three reverse, four reverse locked, and five normal. And only then can we clear signal number one. 
because it only reads to where I've labeled the destination. And once we've moved lever number one, anywhere away from a fully danger stop position, all those point levers will be locked in the position that they're required in. In reality, there'd be more than one lever for signal number one and maybe more than one arm and it would have a lever for each destination. It's unlikely you'd find a signal that only read to one destination in these circumstances. And there would be a complete set of locking for each of those uh, examples. Each of those routes, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there we, okay. and there we go. And that, and that shows how you extrapolate from the very simple example we just had uh, here into increasingly more complex um, routes and paths for, for trains to go. Ah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, last one. Yes, the last slide. Right, so here we go. Right, so uh, I haven't given you the answers on this one because this is a bit of a challenge for you, so I feel very not guilty because you challenged me to that Borough Market Junction thing right uh -huh. at the beginning. Remember I said five bar, and I said it's great because you can get up to five bars, five horizontal lines in each channel. Well, here's two bars. So all of the red components are joined together and all of the blue, is it, I think? Yeah, it is yep. blue, yeah. All of the blue components are joined together. And just to be absolutely clear, they're only connected where there's a blob. So lever number three, for example, has nothing to do with blue whatsoever. You can see that's a red lock and it's connected to the red bar. That's it. There's no blob there where you've just drawn the circle. Yeah. So your challenge is to reverse engineer this. What is locked against what in this? Oh, right. The chat's going to go yeah. wild. But while the chat goes wild, I'm going, to, I'm going to scratch my chin. So um, one is locked against. So, so you'd need to move uh, two. You'd need to move three. But five. So, so, so two needs to be in reverse. Three needs to be in reverse. Five in normal. So that's for the red. That's for the red one. Uh, so that's for one. So that's so you that's need... in order to move number one. So in order right. to move number one, you need two and three to be in reverse. It doesn't matter where four is by the look of it because it's not right. yeah. connect. The dog isn't connected. It's a it's a blue dog. Um, and then yeah, five needs to be in the normal position. Brilliant! Hooray! Everyone in the chat. And... Yeah, people are saying Oops. it as well in the in the chat as well. Good. There's more. Oh gosh. Because there's some blue, isn't there? That blue is uh, is, is serving there a purpose. There is. So I need to then reverse back from that. So one required two to be in reverse, which means then, but two being in reverse. So it, so if we imagine two in reverse, that's then pushed this bar across, which means that uh, four has to be in the normal position. Because if it wasn't in the normal position, this notch would be out of alignment. So you yeah. need so for one to be uh, operated, you need to have uh, two in reverse, three in reverse, four in normal, and five in normal. Is that right? If I confuse myself, it broke up a little bit, but I'm sure you're oh. right. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, four is. Uh, L is getting very nerdy. So the people who play SimSig are currently getting very nerdy in the in the chat. Um, L is saying four is exclusive with one. Uh, uh. Yeah, uh, yes, that's right. Oh. Yes, and with two, and with two, and four needs to be in normal. So, uh, two and three needs to be in reverse. Four and five in normal for one to operate. That's right. But you see, we did it in a. We didn't just have one bar. Yeah. Um, we achieved all that by saying one requires uh, two and three reverse and five normal. Plus, we made two and four mutually exclusive. And that achieved a slightly different combination of um, of outcome than if we'd done it all on one bar. Mm, yeah. And if you um, advance the slide, you'll see the. Yes. Um, there Here's we go. The arrangement. Yeah. Okay. So again, there would be more locking than this on a layout like this, but it does work, and uh, I'm sure if it doesn't, somebody will tell us because uh, it's it's really interesting. I love it, but it's there's a reason why this stuff is designed by professionals and then checked and tested. <laughs> So it wouldn't surprise me at all if when I drew it all on my own, uh, there's a mistake. Um, but yes, the, so signals one and four only read to where it says destination. So one requires five points normal, i.e. in the position they are, and two reverse and three reverse uh, to lock it. Uh, and signal four just requires two normal. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So two to be normal. Yeah, there we go. Mm. Okay, yeah. 
and we get every reciprocal for free as we know once we've cleared signal number one all the points are locked in position once you've cleared signal number four all the points are locked in position or the relevant points the relevant points yeah yeah oh look at this right um, have you had... <laughs> now john yeah john you're asking a complicated question i suppose the point is it depends on what sort of other operating moves are in amongst it john asks uh, why couldn't one construct the same logic using only a single bar um I suppose that depends on the other variations of of destination that you want, right? Um, uh, yes. I mean, there's there's always more than one way to do this. Oh, in fact, oh, I did draw you an alternative, uh, but I forgot to put it in. Sorry. There's always uh, many, okay, many, yeah. probably infinite numbers, probably, of ways to arrange this to achieve what you want. I don't think that that could be done with just one bar, I have to say. I don't think you'd get away with it um oh you might actually on the basis that one and four only read to the same destination yeah ah, okay. so i'm certainly not saying that's the only way to achieve the locking for that diagram i'm just saying that is one way of yeah. achieving one type of locking for yeah. one designer of millions of different ways you could arrange <laughs> it for that made up location and you can see very quickly how that how much this becomes you know, a comp there are, I know that there are at least one programming peoples in the chat right now. This very rapidly becomes a complex logic puzzle, and yeah, absolutely, and, and, and therefore needs pretty decent levels of checking to make sure it's all got right. Um, absolutely, yeah. So, right, we shall okay. pass on to the next. So, oh, yeah. here's some, some images, right? So, everything we've talked about has been mechanical, mechanical frames, mechanical locking. But remember, we said it's not restricted to just semaphore signals. Of course, initially it was, and gradually things have moved on. Um, so here are some developments in technology that allowed things to move on through this, this chronology of different uh, methods of operating. So first of all, on the left-hand side is a color light signal. That's a massive advancement from semaphores. Uh, I know, before everybody says, they're not anywhere near as elegant as, uh, as a nice uh, semaphore signal, um, especially the number of arms that you'd need to re uh, replicate that uh, colour light. But there's a reason why I put that photo of it in the snow and in yes, the fog. Yes, I was going to say, it's it, for anyone who's just watching this or listening to this in audio-only form, it's in pea-soupy, miry, snowy, miserable weather. That's right. And, yeah. and that green light is, is visible. Yeah, and, and that is a, a massive advantage of colour light signals. No moving parts. That's another advantage, less to maintain, mm. less to go wrong, less to break. Um, and, in fact, you, you've nicely set me up for this. Um, remember you asked about the maximum distance for pulling ah, a yes. signal wire? Well, of course, very. Uh, you, there is a limit to how far you can put wired, uh, electric current down a cable, I'm sure. Uh, but it's not a thousand yards. Uh, yeah. So this is one of many things that um, allowed uh, signal boxes to control signaling that was further away. Uh, than a thousand yards. The GWR in the 1930s had an active program of replacing color light distance signals, which are the furthest ones out, hence distant, uh, with color lights um, in the 1930s. Active replacement program. Obviously, they didn't get them all, but they completely recognized yeah. that color light distance were uh, the way forward. And there's very few semaphore distance, worked semaphore distance uh, left now. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was taken at Slough, incidentally. Uh, that's on the down relief, just approaching Slough Station. And the junction indicators on the top, which you get five, I'm sure you've explained this before, but you get five white lights in a, in a, in a bar. Uh, the number four junction indicator, which is the one diagonally off to the right, is for movements crossing over from the down relief to the up relief. And you used to be able to go, or you still can, down the up relief through Slough Station and cross back over. And the number five feather, the one horizontally to the right, that's for movements going into the old platform six at Slough, which I'm pretty sure isn't there anymore, the old bay platform on the upper right. side. Yeah. So cool. that's where that was uh, on a very snowy day. Yeah, and, uh, um, yeah, yeah. and, and you've got that. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's like various other bits and pieces of like, uh, yeah, position. Yeah, uh, so, uh, position light, exactly. So if uh, when the main signal is red, the position light can show two whites, two white lights at a 45 degree angle. And it means that the, the driver can proceed, but that the line ahead is obstructed and he's got to proceed at a speed where he can stop short of presumably a train uh, further ahead. And the little box underneath it will give him some indication as to where he's going by illuminating a letter. So it probably said something like R for relief or B for bay or something like that. Uh, underneath that's the number. Every signal has a number and nearly every single now has a plate on it, but certainly colour lights have plates on it. The S was for slough, that's the controlling signal box, and the number is just a number that's unique to all the S signals. 
And underneath, that's the telephone for the driver to ring up before we used to have yeah, GSMR. Nice, nice not that long ago. Lovely, yeah. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Marvellous, and there we go. So, um... so that was one brilliant advancement in technology mm. which moved things along a little bit. On the right-hand side, there's a picture of a set of points not worked by a rod, and we didn't cover it, but incidentally, about 350 yards is about as far as you can get due to the weight of the rodding that you're trying to move. Ah, that answers a question from earlier. Thank you. Brilliant. That is an electric machine with a motor in it for moving the point blades backwards and forwards. And that was another great advancement in signaling technology that allowed, um, enabled signal boxes to control signaling that was much further away uh, than the previous uh, limits. And certainly when you look at some big locations, well, like Exeter, for example, where there was boxes within less than 100 yards of each other. And in one case at Exeter, there was two signal boxes on opposite sides of the track, the signalman looking across at each other, just because the layout was so complicated and you couldn't go more than 350 yards away from a set of points before you needed a signal box, that there was just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of signal boxes all controlling their tiny little bit of the layout. And although that's magnificent and I love it and I wish I could have been there, it's very expensive. <laughs> uh, so not not the best thing in the railway's eyes. That bottom picture is at Cheltenham Racecourse on the Gloucestershire Warwickshire Railway, uh, oh, looking right. from the head shunt uh, back towards the station. That, is that an old, is that like, oh golly, this is temp. My points operating equipment knowledge is, is shaky. Is that an old Mark II? is it or is it even oh it looks like an hw oh, it's an HW. oh gosh it's i'm HW. not an expert i'm not an engineer by the way i'm an operations person so but it looks <laughs> yeah. like an hw machine to yeah, me yeah yeah um oh and I'm... earlier we talked about the um the stretcher bars and uh and so these yes. that's these things here They're that's okay. it there's no fpl on uh, on this one but yeah that's that's the um the stretcher bar yeah. uh, the one slightly closer to us is is the drive stretcher that's what's yeah. um uh, oh, actually, hang on a second. It might be the detector stretcher, actually. Oh, I don't know. Um, you can get different stretchers for different purposes. And one of them, if it had an FPL, would be the lock stretcher. And that would be the one with the notches in that exactly had to line. Um, but it's important because um, there's... Uh, uh, remember, we said there's there's repeaters in the, in the signal box. So the signalman can check that the points have or that the equipment has actually moved. Points have those as well. Um, little electrical micro switches that only make when the point blades are fully one side or the other and they're inside the machine but it's really important that we're not just monitoring the position of the machine and that the bars that join the machine to the yeah. point blades haven't broken so there'll be drive rods that connect the the blades to the machine the machine to the blades and then there'll be a separate set of rods attached to the blades that feed back into the detector. So the, the motion has to go from the machine through the point blade and back into the detector. Yeah. And obviously, if any part of that breaks, it, the, the movement won't get all the way back into the detector. Yeah, so I think, I, I, I presume the movement is happening here and then the detection of these slightly thinner ones that are pushing back into the back Yes, into it looks like it with the swan necks, certainly, yeah. because I think they'd bend off, you know. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. Right, there we go. So, so that's okay. So we have... The, the the colored uh, aspect signal we've got a set of points that's What's, it and this last describe the last then, image that we've seen in here. the middle and this is the diagram from exeter west and while i'm plugging swindon panel i plug exeter west as well it's a great thing to go and visit <laughs> and anyone can go and visit it is at crew heritage center hmm. um you'll see that there's some big red lights and these are lights that indicate uh, that, that are fed off the track circuits so the signalman can see where the trains are even when he can't see them out the window so this is another brilliant advancement that in this particular layout, nearly everywhere was covered by a track circuit. Um, and you could go for miles and miles and miles and miles. And as long as sigmund has got some track circuits there so you can see where the trains are on the diagram, even though you can't see them out the window, it's another thing that enables you to control signaling that's a lot, lot further away. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I suppose there's a combination here where the, you could you could argue that technology is taking power away from the signaler, but actually in the same in the same breath, because of the additional distance and range that the technology enables, actually the signaler they are gaining more control because they're actually gaining more of an area to to, to be operated under you know yes. with with us under one hand if you like. And all this advancement in technology is only to stop the human making a mistake. In as far as we've got in the story so far. The, the human still has to pull the lever and it's only additional safeguards being added on that if it wasn't actually safe to do that, then we'll either stop the person doing it or we'll stop the equipment responding if we, if we have allowed them to pull the lever. We're not taking any of the responsibility away. We're not taking any of the rules 
We're not taking any of the emergency stuff away where the equipment fails or a train doesn't obey the equipment or anything like that. We're just responding to accidents that have taken place through human error and building systems so that they can't happen again, really. Indeed. So there we go. That is the... Um, mm. So that's those uh, those three images. Thanks for describing. So the yeah. next uh, is right wowzer. So... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> so this is another advancement in technology. We talked about mechanical uh, locking. This is electrical locking. So we've already said that... Uh, when we talked about the buttons on the block shelf, that levers can be locked by electrical locks with electromagnets in them that, that withdraw the lock. We've already said that uh, we can detect where a train is. We can detect what position points are in. We can do all that stuff electrically. And again, even though there are mechanical methods of doing a lot of those things, um, it is easier to do them electrically or in many ways, not in always, but in many ways, there's fewer moving parts. You can control equipment that's further away. There was an earlier generation of relay than this. This is a, a modern one. Um, but a relay, if you're not aware, is just an electric switch with an armature that can move backwards and forwards and a big electromagnet that either pulls the armature towards it or when it's not energized, the armature moves away from it. So you can build logical circuits with these relays in the same way that we did mechanically. You can say it's A or B or you can say A requires B. And you can imagine that it's a lot easier to make really, really complicated, really complex logical arrangements with uh, electrical switches than it is with, with mechanics. I mean, yeah. we didn't even talk about ifs in the um, oh, when we did yeah. mechanical. You can have A and B or C. And you can do it mechanically, but it starts to get a bit complicated. Um, whereas electrically, really easy. Um, so these are called 930 series relays. They're like the standard go-to interlocking relay. There's one that's close up on the left hand side and then on the right hand side, you can see two racks of them and there will be hundreds, if not thousands of them um, in a relay interlocking. So if, if you imagine that in that photo on the right hand side, there's two racks there. You can just about see there's a gap between them. There's the one nearest us and the one furthest away. Um, if you imagine um, a station like the old Reading, for those of you that remember the old Reading, there would easily be 20 racks of those relays oh, just wow. for Reading Station, not the whole area that Reading Panel controlled, just for Reading Station. Um, in Swindon, where I obviously did a lot of preservation work, there was easily 10 of those racks. There's lots of different types of relay, some of them like slow to pick or slow to drop or different voltages. Some of them are what's called vital. Those ones there are vital. They are guaranteed to fail in the safe position, in the unenergized position. And a lot of really expensive work goes into those uh, contactor terminals to make sure that they can't weld themselves together after years and years and years of use. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah. There are other types of relay called non-vital relays. And every different railway company, every different contractor has its own way of designing and putting them together and designing how the logic is going to work. Uh, between them this enabled much more railways worth of interlocking to be compacted into a small area um, uh, and, uh, and, and contributed to the increased range that a signalman uh, could control earlier relays were much bigger so you didn't quite get the space saving and again I'm going to reiterate that I'm not covering every point in railway history here we're, we're jumping over huge sections yeah. Um, but electromechanical interlocking is what this is, and um, and, it, and it was a huge leap forward, and and stuff that would never have been economical to do mechanically suddenly became uh, easily achievable. It's, yeah, I think I mean you've described these wonderfully, but I think I'm even going to maybe dive into a really uh, explicit description of these images for for the audio describable uh, stuff because it's such a fascinating series of images. Um, uh, Conscious time, I'm going to be super quick with this, but so so we've got the close up image of of a of a relay box which has that might not be the right terminology. Everyone shout at me, um, and it has so it's a plastic a clear plastic case with like a sort of loops on it to attach. In fact, there's an older one in the middle. There's a newer looking Unipart rail one closer to us, and then there's a slightly older looking oh. one. Um, in so that's actually got its date on it, which says 70, June seventy five. I might be again wrong on that, but it's um, yeah. Uh, and and so there's a, a clearish plastic box uh, with like bakelite rounded curves, just for anyone who really wants to get a vibe for the aesthetic. And inside it is lots of various looking coloured bits of different metals um, and different kind of plates, all they all, all arranged to achieve something. Just like that. That's all they do. Yeah. Well, they're that obviously, but 
to, to, so they're just there to make a contact. But they, but as you say, they, they have lots of different ways in which they do that. So you said some are slow, some are uh, critical, so they, they, they always fail safe. We had a question, which is, uh, if there's a power cut, how does this all work? Um, uh, it's from just David like Shepherd, everything in railway signalling, it will, will be inherent in the design from the very first day that it will fail safe. So a track circuit, if the power fails, uh, there is no current to flow to prove that there is no train on the track. So it will presume there is a train on the track and interlock accordingly. Every single one of these relays in every single interlocking in the whole country is designed to be in the safe position when it's de-energized, in the locked position, in the you cannot do the thing you want to do position. And it requires electricity to lift it up into the yes, you can do that position. Mm. And... The circuit, which incidentally we'll, we'll see in a second, will go through loads and loads of other relays, checking all the things that need to be made, need, need to be done first um, before this particular relay is allowed uh, to pick. You can just about see if you look down, you might have to indicate with your arrow, if you look down the, the, the contacts on the left hand side of this relay that's nearest to us in the left hand picture, sorry. Am I describing very well? You can see. Yeah. So not quite those, but ah. come over to the right a little bit. Uh, okay, ah, so the these these here, the um, uh, I can't quite see. No, uh, yes, okay, yes. And if you look at the left-hand vertical line of those, yes, of those sixteen here. contacts. That's it. I think I can just about see. Yes. So you can just about make out that the top ones, the nibs are together, the contacts are together, ah, and the bottom yes. two, the contacts are apart. Yes. Can you see that? Yep. Yeah. And when that. the relay moves to its other position, the top ones will come apart and the bottom ones will close up. And you can get different combination of, let's call them normally open and normally closed. Normally open is called a front contact in a relay and normally closed is called a back contact. Um, you can get different uh, combinations of how many you want, depending on what circuitry you want to make. And, and there are hundreds of these placed on these racks just to get to continue the kind of the visual imagery. I, I, I do my best to create hundreds of these placed. And actually, they, they look like and I was thinking this even with the mechanical um, with the mecha purely mechanical interlocking. They look I mean, the mechanical interlocking looks like a Babbage machine. These look like the early computers. You know, they, they are. Yes. I mean, and that is what they are. They are computers. That's that's that's, that's, right, that's, yeah. that's what they are. And, and, and some of them, some of them have storage. Oh, wow. Um, Mm. Uh, some of them are magnetically latched. And so once they're energized to one position or the other, they magnetically stay there until they're forcibly energized over to the other position. They are not yeah. sprung like we've talked about so far. Um, whereas in general, it's energized to the made position and then sort of de-energized and it naturally falls away by gravity. But some of them are magnetically latched. So if you imagine, oh, and I don't believe it, a WZR is magnetically latched. So this ah, 353 WZR... That whole box is one bit of memory. Not even one byte. It's one, one bit. bit of memory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it can remember whether it's up or down, regardless of power failures or anything like that. Um, it, it will remember. And there's, there's useful reasons in interlockings why you might want something to remember where it last was until it's forcibly pushed over to the other side. And there are uh, places where it's useful to... Um, energize a relay and then rely on the fact that when you stop energizing it'll go back to its its normal it's, position its default position yeah i mean there are lots of people saying yeah you can build a computer for your pre layer of relays yeah people do it in things like minecraft where they you have like essentially have the you know the water functions and the all the various things you can do in minecraft and yes. you create computers and that's again following this, exactly this sort of the same. Logic. so i suppose does so, this does this follow the law of i wonder if if signaling as a discipline and or, or certainly in the physical uh, representation signaling follows the rule of of kind of computer power and space usage if you go back to how much space you'd need need to replicate this in purely mechanical signaling you know you're talking about hectares and then <laughs> you know reducing and yes, reducing it, i don't know if there's an actual numerical value for that but definitely and we'll see when we get on in a minute to the electronic stuff rather than the electromechanical stuff it is definitely getting smaller um, I've just been reminded by the way uh, and i should give him a plug there's yet another preserved signal box at romsey which is a mechanical signal box, and it's got loads of fun toys to play with, and it's open twice a month, uh, the first Sunday and the third Saturday, I think, but look it up on their website. And uh, conveniently, I'm being prompted uh, in things that I've forgotten to say uh, oh, yeah, by good. one of the volunteers <laughs> called Jamie, and he's reminded me to point out that I laboured how mechanical locking was reciprocal unless you make it not. Electrical locking, not so. 
Ah, you okay. have to specify absolutely every function that you need. Just because with electrical locking you've done A locks B, you have to explicitly do B locks A. It's, it's not reciprocal in the same way. Ah, there we go. So pros and cons, uh, as yeah, with everything. Yeah. That's uh, fast. Yeah, right. So, con uh, good grief. I mean, we could we could do this for hours and hours, and I I would love to. And actually, yeah. maybe maybe a, 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 we've done our first on location rail natter last week. And um, maybe a future one is to actually go and visit one of these panels and do an episode as a pre-record and actually Ooh. visit and explore the Swindon panel, for example. I would, I would honestly love to do that, and we could chat more. That's right. So, uh, okay. and here, so here is a diagram. We've got another diagram yeah. back up again. So again, I've made you some little diagrams. Uh, there's a track layout. It's very simple. There's a signal number eight and there's a set of points number six. And now that you know everything about how to read these diagrams and incidentally, if you can read one, you can read them all. You know, they're all pretty much the same. You can see immediately that in order to clear signal number eight, uh, points number six, both ends have to be reversed. Otherwise, it will just come off the end into nowhere. And there are places on the railway where that happens for safety. It's preferable to not a passenger train, but preferable to derail a runaway train and let it carry on. Mm. So we need, in order to, for signal number eight to clear, uh, points number six to be reverse. Remember we talked about track circuits. This is how track circuits are shown on some types of diagram, that little loz in shape with three letters above it. So there's AF track, alpha foxtrot oh. track on the left-hand yeah. side, alpha golf track in the middle, and alpha hotel track on the right-hand mm. side. It's always the phonetic alphabet in the railway. Otherwise, you get, you know, T and B get confused on the phone, things like that. So in the middle diagram, this is how it would be drawn on the railway, where you've just got to get from one side to the other. It's not like it is a circuit, but we don't draw the circuit. We just say you've got to start at one side and get to the other. So you go along the circuit, and this is the wire flowing around the relay room, visiting all these different relays. So the first relay it gets to is 6RWCR. And there's this brilliant alphabet of signaling terminology, reverse points, checking or proving relay, RWCR. So that relay will only be up, it will only be energized when um, uh, number six points are checked to be in reverse. Uh, and that little symbol with the V on it um, is a front contact. It means that is a contact that made when the relay is energized, when it has been proven to be true, uh, then the current can flow a little bit further. The next relay that it gets to, so the wire's gone whizzing around the relay room to find 6LR, 6 lock relay. And a lock relay, uh, I should also say, again, many different types of interlocking made by many different manufacturers. This is a very cheap version of something called E10K, which is a Western region type thing. There'd be different nomenclature for these relays doing the same oh, okay. purpose on different areas. In just in case anyone's getting accept going, that's yeah, everyone's cool. writing down notes and saying, right, okay, I need to order one of those things. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so six LR six lock relay is ah. Now remember, this has to be fail safe. So do you think a lock relay is going to be energized when the points are locked, or de-energized when the points are locked? Bearing in mind that locked is the safe thing for them to be. Yeah, de-energized, presumably. De-energized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because if the power fails, we want them to fall to the locked position. We don't want a fault or a broken wire to mean the points suddenly become free. So you see this time the little V is underneath the line. That means it's a back contact. We want that relay to be down. We want the points to be in the locked state so that they cannot be allowed to move in order for the current to flow a little bit further. Flows a little bit further. The next one it gets to is Alpha Foxtrot, Track Repeat Relay TPR. Uh, again, it's got to be fail safe. So the relay will be up to prove that the, uh, the track is clear. If the track was occupied or any failure have occurred, the relay would be down. We want it to be up to prove the track is clear. So if Alpha Foxtrot track, the one on the little on the left hand side there, uh, is clear, uh, that relay will be up. We can carry on a little bit further. The next one is another TPR, another track repeat relay for Alpha Golf track. We've got to prove that one is clear as well. And if any one of those conditions wasn't met, if six points reverse checking was down, or if six lot relay was up, or if Alpha Foxtrot or Alpha Golf relays were down, any one of those conditions not being met would mean we couldn't get to that box with 8HR written on it on the right-hand side. And 8HR in E10K is the yellow relay. It's H for yellow, and it's the yellow relay for number eight. It's the relay that allows the signal to step up from red to yellow, from stop to an arbitrary proceed color, but in this case, yellow. All those conditions have to be met. I've drawn it underneath in what might be considered slightly more um, normal uh, circuitry uh, form with little flappy gates that open. So starting on the left again, six points 
Uh, reverse has to be made, so we need that switch to be operated. Points have to be not free, so we don't want the points free switch to be operated. We want it in its unoperated position like it is at the moment. And AF and AG, we need them both to be operated. We need them both to be proved clear. And then as I've drawn on the little battery, you can see that it becomes a circuit. It's just that in the railway, it's not drawn as a circuit. That's a really simple example. You could put an or in by putting two switches in parallel. You can put an and by putting switches in series. And you can make it as massively complicated as your heart's desire. And, and it will work. <laughs> and some of them really are complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, that, again, another really nice, clear explanation. But I think people can imagine quite quickly how, it, how you can extrapolate this into immense complexity. Definitely, um, yeah. So... So, th so that's so that's the that's the interlocking. Now we move into the realm of the panel. Um, yeah. So all those things. Sorry, Gareth. Sorry. No, no, no. Go on. Go on. I was going to say all those things that we've just said: color light signals, motorized points, track circuits, electrical interlocking, being able to control things that were further away, meant that actually the physical muscles to move levers were no longer required. We did go through a little stage of having miniature levers that were just electric switches, but I haven't really contacted on that here. Really, we can just turn those levers into electric switches and we don't need that massive lever frame and all that mechanical locking anymore because we can achieve everything electrically. So the first types of panels really just were switches that replaced uh, mechanical levers. So if you yeah, wouldn't mind sorry. going to slide Flick on. Over. Thanks to Andrew Gardner this for this is, photo, by the way. Sorry? Thanks to Andrew Gardner for this photo. Uh, oh, brilliant. Yes, it's an Andrew Gardner his. photo. Carmandine Junction between um, uh, on the Bathgate line between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Oh. This is not an early panel, I hasten to add. It was just a good photo of a one control switch panel that I could find. You can see it's got a diagram on it. You all know how to read a diagram now because I've told you. <laughs> uh, you can see it's got lights on the tracks that light up when the track circuit is occupied. And you can see it's got a row of levers at the top. And the levers are all in normal at the moment. Uh, and in fact, on the one, two, three, fourth one along, because that lever that's actually a switch controls a set of points, you can see it's even labeled normal and reverse. Whereas the signals ones are not labeled normal and reverse. They're labeled on and off. On means the signal is at its most restrictive. So red in the case of a stop signal and off means it's any proceed color. Generally, as far as the operator is concerned, we don't care what color it's showing once it's at proceed. It could be yellow, double yellow, two white lights, flashing yellow, yellow with a feather, anything like that. The, the operator only cares whether it's stop or go, whether it's danger or proceed. Um, and the actual color that it's shown is worked out automatically by the interlocking based on the color of the signal ahead. So you could probably, if you studied this for a while, yes, there's four signals and four signal switches. So if we look at the one on the right hand most side, is that Charlie Delta, I imagine? Yes, it Carmen is. D. Charlie Delta 579. Charlie Delta 579. And you can see directly underneath it on the diagram, there's a little lollipop shape. That's it, which is where the signal is on the drawing. In fact, it's the mirror image almost of the, the, the diagram that we had on the previous slide. It's mm -hmm. two tracks going down to one. But the key thing is uh, you have to operate it like a lever frame. You have to set the points and then only when the points are set, you have to clear the signal. Now, obviously, there's no mechanical locking. There's nothing to stop you turning a switch in the wrong order. But if you turn it when it's not appropriate, it just won't obey. Mm. So you have to operate it like a mechanical lever frame. And that's all it is. It is just a replacement for that with no mechanical locking. Everything achieved electrically and color lights and motorized points. The great emancipator, because all of a sudden, weedy people like me could start becoming signalers. It's great. <laughs> uh, well, it's all about technique. There's a lot of signalmen that are very small and weedy, um, but it's all about technique, I promise. It's not to do with strength at all. <laughs> um, if you can, you know, if you understand when you're operating the lever about how you can exert the mechanical advantage on it, um, you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> so I love this. I love this partly because it looks it looks like something you could pick up and put under your arm and kind of wander yes. off with. It looks a bit like a, kind of a little <laughs> fridge or something. You know, it's a funny little piece of kit. This I like it. Um, mm. uh, yes. Yeah, so so that, that that's so that's a really nice color one. So the next, uh, uh, let me get rid of my okay. scribbles so people can enjoy it. That's okay. So the next image is ah yeah. yeah so uh, so that panel was uh, individual function switches. The next is one control switch. So that's I'll put it. the image up. And you can see that's anything but one switch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, it's a misnomer. And exactly like with mechanical, where we started off small and then we got bigger, and that's exactly how it happened in real life, up to 180-odd levers in, in Sevenbridge Junction. Same with panels. We'll start off with a small one. Oh, we can do this with five, so let's do it with 10. Let's do it with 100. This is a really big panel for its type. It's not a big panel as panels go, but it's a big panel of its type. Mm. 
Now, the key thing here is, remember I said in the previous uh, picture, you've got to work it like a lever frame. You've got to swing the points and then you can clear the signal. Yes. Well, if it's all electric, why don't we just make it so that the signalman doesn't have to operate the points from side to side. And when he turns the switch for the signal, it moves the points as well. Mm. That would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? Mm. So this is what a one control switch panel is. And the key, the key word, uh, the key sort of phrase here is root setting. This is, this is the first generation of root setting panel. Not this exact example before anyone comes up with that. But one <laughs> control switch, you have one switch that sets the whole root. Even if there's 10 sets of points that all need to be moved to different positions, you have one switch for each possible root. And you switch it and it moves all the points. And as long as all the points are electrically detected to move into the right position, and as long as that route is actually free to be set, the signal will come off. And route setting saves a lot of uh, effort, a lot of labor, um, a lot of uh, thinking about which sets of points, which switches you need. If you know you want to go from this signal to this signal, and it's always signal to signal, signal to buffers or whatever, you know, but it's always a fixed point to a fixed point, um, turn the switch, and if it can, it will, and if it can't, it won't. So this is uh, Clarbeston Road uh, in West Wales, uh, and it's the biggest one control switch panel I could find a photo of. I'm sure there are bigger ones. The reason why there are so many switches is because there is a switch for every single route. If a signal has two routes from it, there'll be two switches. So if we look along the bottom sets of switches, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, that's it, yeah. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's one switch on its own. Don't so that signal only has one route. And in fact, because it's got four sets of lights above it, that switch is actually controlling two signals, probably a stop signal and its repeater. So there'll be a red green, which will be the lights immediately above the switch and a yellow green, the lights above that. The next switch along to the right, again, is only contro is controlling a signal that only has one route. So you've only got one choice. But the next set of switches, two, sig two switches vertically above each other, that's still one signal. But it's got two routes. It's got two options. It would have been two levers in a mechanical box. So if you want to go from this signal to one of its two destinations, you operate one of the switches. And if you want to go to the other destination, you operate the other switch. And it will the interlocking will command the points if they're free into the required position. And then as long as they all go, the signal will clear. And that's how it works. And, and again, it's so again with this with technology. This is enabling actually more safety because if you're reducing signaler workload then the signaler is able to you know if you if, if as a signaler you've got you've got to remember every time you want to do one move all right i need to do that 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 there's more chance for error right whereas in this situation less workload which means it's easier for the signaler to check what they're doing and make sure that the, the maneuvers they do, that the actions they're doing are safe right that's it and if you notice also it's on a nice desk with a little train register and a cup of tea and a few telephones it's a lot more I don't want to say civil, but it's a lot calmer working environment mm. than doing a lever frame. And don't get me wrong, people that operate lever frames operate them very calmly and are very proficient and very rarely go for a lever that's locked. But this is this is simpler, isn't it? This is uh, less onerous to operate. Yeah, and as we know now, with the benefit of hindsight, we understand that from a safety perspective, ergonomics are very important. You know, yes. making the, make, you know understanding behavioral aspects to, to the way that, that, you know, that that interface between the physical and the, and the human is critical. Absolutely yeah. safety critical. Um, so the cup of tea is a, is a fundamentally important safety feature here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. It really there is. was a period in history, and I can't remember which accident it relates to now, but maybe somebody else will. Uh, where the um, accident report um, for an accident criticised how comfy the signal boxes were and said <laughs> all the armchairs should be removed. Um, and certainly early railway companies that heavily resisted, in many cases, all these technological advancements because they were expensive, yes. heavily resisted putting signal boxes in buildings with roofs on the top because it would make the signalman lazy and too comfortable and fall asleep and all those things. And as you say, now we're a bit wiser to, to all that, but it is still is still a thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah, it's it's interesting to see this development. And, and yeah, that that switch. I mean, the the thing that forced the new technology. I mean, there, there are lots of complicated uh, inputs, but part of it was labor started costing a lot more after the Second World War. Up to that yeah. point, labor was cheap, so there was no particular incentive to to be so. So as you described with the distance signals being changed to to color lights, the, even that yeah. that the Great Western did was was really 
you know, it's because it was the balancing of labor saving rather than, you know, and, and it's only really after the Second World War where we had chronic shortages of, of labor, but also a, a surge in other sorts of jobs that we needed to, uh, to, to mechanize, to automate. Another reason, apart from that color lights are easier to see why the Great Western was replacing its distance was because in foggy weather, because the oil lamps were difficult to see, you had to provide a fog man who went out and, if he was lucky, had a little hut to hide in by the distance signal with a big tin of detonators. And every time a train went past and the distance signal was at caution, he had to put a detonator on the line so that the driver would hear that he's at the location and the distance signal was at caution. And again, that's really expensive to provide. And so Colour Lights negated that requirement. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and again, this is very this, this isn't the this is far from new and snazzy necessarily what we're looking at now, but it's it's remarkably neat, tidy, clever. It's uh, yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. Right, uh, golly, we should we should we should press press on. Okay. I'm, I'm a dreadful uh, chair of the discussion in terms of moving things on because I would happily chat for hours about these things. Right, so this is where we start getting into uh, perhaps we might say more familiar territory for 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 more modern stuff. So. Mm. This I've not put this in inverted commas because you didn't on your slide when you, you sent them over to me, but I presume that's because it, it's uh, this is starting to get more technology. So this is entrance exit panels, uh, and there's a bracket NX written here. Um, disc- explain explain this, uh, Danny. Uh, it's it's just what they refer to as it's the N out of entrance and the X out of exit. So I don't think you could have called them EE. Um, yes, so that that's what sense. it is, and it will become clear why we call it or why it is called entrance exit. So is it, are these called NX panels? Is that is That's that right, how they're yeah. called? Yeah, okay, right. Exactly. So here and here is one, and this here already it's a work of art. Yeah. So this is Salisbury or one end of Salisbury. The whole thing is a bit bigger than this. Um, and compared to the previous panel where all the switches were at the bottom, some bright spark had the idea: why don't we arrange the switches on the map geographically for the signal that they apply to? And that was obviously a brilliant idea because it made the, the visual relationship between mm. the picture on the map and, and the location of the signal uh, immediately apparent. This is still a route setting panel, but it's a bit of a different uh, kettle of fish. Uh, and it was designed when panels became uh, much bigger and much more complicated and you couldn't have coped with um, a switch for every route. Although there are some really big ones like York, for example, I'm pretty sure was an OCS panel, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of switches. And I'm sure oh, there yeah. are other examples, yeah, but... Yeah. This is a this is a this is a better way of having a root setting panel in terms of its ergonomics. So if we look over on the left hand side where I've put the A next to signal number 40, there's a button there. This is called an entrance button. So when you want to set a route from signal number 40 and you can see that there are two potential exits, there's B and C, B at signal number 30, 30, I should say, uh, and C at signal number 36. Instead of having two buttons at signal 40, you provide one button at signal 40 to say, this is where we want to start. This is the entrance of the route and we will press it into the panel and it will start flashing to say, yes, you've pressed me. And now we will select one of the two options for the exit. So we will press either the button at B or the button at C. And that is the way by which we tell the interlocking which route we want, rather than having two switches at 40 one for each route. Now, although having two switches at 40 might not look too confusing in this circumstance, when you have this massive triangular junction, as you can see, if every signal had a switch for every possible route that it could possibly do, there would be quite a lot of uh, buttons there. Yeah. Now, looking at uh, B again, we've set the route from 40 to 30, from A to B. So signal number 40, if it can, will clear. We don't care to what color. We just care that it's clear. But actually, it'll be yellow if signal number 30 is red. We want to be able to do the next bit of route now. So having pressed 30 as the exit from the route that we were just setting, we will now press it again to be the entrance to the next route. And then this route ends at 28, which I didn't put a letter on. But you can see the next logical signal. That's the one. And you go along, you set it like that, you go entrance, exit, and then you press the same button again as the entrance to the next route, exit, and then you press the same button again as the entrance to the next route. And it's, and the the, the, the way your hand goes along the panel is the route that the train is going to take. You haven't got to map the map, Mm. you haven't got to mentally convert the map to switches down below. Now, as well as A at 40, having two potential exits at B and C, 
If we look at C, and it's only got one available exit, which is E at 34. But F also has a route all the way round to E. So in one example, we had one entrance with two exits. Now we've just had two entrances leading to the same exit. You can have it in any possible permutation that you want. You can have 10 entrances and 10 exits, and some lead to some, and some don't lead to others where there is a legitimate route for the train to take. But crucially, you just put one button at every signal, and the signalman picks the pairs that he wants the route to be set between. So it's still route setting like one control switch, but the mechanism by which we select the route, there's layers of interlocking and the first layer is selection. It's how you tell the interlocking what you actually want and then it goes away and locks it. Instead of boringly having one switch for each thing that you can ask the interlocking for, here there's another layer of complexity between you and the interlocking saying, I'm going to give you this nice array of buttons so that you can geographically press the buttons that you want. Uh, and we will ask the interlocking for those routes for you. If the interlocking is still exactly the same. If you ask for something that it doesn't want to give you, then it just won't give it to you. There's nothing to stop you pressing all the buttons at once if you want to, but you won't get all the routes because the interlocking is still the same and still born out of the same principles that came out of the mechanical boxes. Mm. Um, up the top, incidentally, uh, those are called individual point switches. So we said that route setting panels move all the points for you automatically based on what routes you ask it for. And that's true. But you can also move the points if you need to individually, such as if you're making an unsignaled move or for testing. All the switches normally live in the middle position, the center, it's called. And center means that they're free to be swung by the route setting system. If the signaler operates it to normal or reverse, still subject to interlocking, so if they try to do it at a time when it's not free, it just won't obey. But if it is free and the signaler operates it to normal or reverse, then it can't be then overridden by the route setting system. It's locked in that position. So certainly talking trains pass signals at danger, for example, every single set of points in the route has to be operated on the individual switch um, to the required position. And then you have to put a magnetic reminder appliance over the switch to make sure that you don't accidentally uh, operate it when you shouldn't. A reminder, say, this is here for a reason. Um, but I, I, I'm going to try and steer clear of going into how we deal with faults and failures for the sake yeah, of this. Yeah, because that, that feels like a future, <laughs> it's a future episode yeah. in of itself, yeah. Um, uh, while, while, while we're on Sorry. this one, I just wanted to point out this, which I really like, which is a little note describing... Uh, oh, right. if, if 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 trains go through things that signals have, we shouldn't dwell on it, but it's just interesting because you can see those and people can go back to the YouTube, uh, they can pause the video when they watch after the fact and read some of those. It's quite interesting because that's just instructions to the signaler to, to know what they do and don't do given certain particular things that might oh, happen I regularly. I hate on panels. <laughs> yeah. I think they look messy. <laughs> yeah. um, now, another interesting thing here, which we haven't seen before, is in actual fact when this picture was taken, the route was set from A to B, from 40 to 30, and then on to 28, and you can see there's white lights. Are they all white? All yeah. white, that's along there. They're called white route lights, and they light up where the route is set. Mm. And it's really helpful, because it shows you when the route has been properly set up. It shows you the route the train is going to follow. There will still be red lights for the track circuits, same as all the way back to mechanical days. And the red lights will come and eat up the white lights as they move along. And they should follow if everything's gone correctly, they should follow the path set for them by the white lights. So, the so again, red, really so all of these are orangey, orange, I presume kind of red, but the camera they're, slightly they're bleached white. them. Uh, oh, are they? Because there is an obviously white one at the end, and all the others look slightly yellowy. But actually, are they all, they're all white. It's just the camera. And, and then they'll pop up properly red as the train passes That's through. It. Ah, okay, I see. Um, certainly, the one that you've put a circle around has to be the same colour as the two to the left of it. Because a whole track circuit either has to be clear or occupied. Ah, yeah, fair so point. they're either yeah, all yeah. red, or they're all white, or they're all out. So uh, so don't be fooled, people, looking at this. Th these are the same colour, it's just that the camera is just slightly... Uh, and different them. ages of bulb, probably. Oh, yeah, OK, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, when they're replaced at different times, for sure. Yeah. So that was another really helpful, useful, ergonomic, advance NX panels with white route lights to tell you where the route has been set. Really useful. Um, so we have some uh, questions here from, uh, firstly from Matt Reed. Why are the tracks coloured in different colours? I presume that's just to delineate different track circuits. Yes, um, this is a southern region uh, panel. Not all regions coloured their track circuits in. So on the western region, they were all black. 
And you just okay. had to look for where the little white dots were between them to see where they uh, where they were separated. And you could have endless arguments about which is best. <laughs> yes. um, I don't know whether it, it happens here, but generally it's yellow and green on uplines and green and brown. Sorry, yellow and blue on uplines and green and brown on downlines. Mm. But uh, if you're into geometry, you'll know that that's not always possible. And so sometimes they have to insert extra colors yes. because of the way things join together. Yes. Um, and so sometimes you see pinks and things like that uh, where, where it where it where because you can't have two of the same color next to each other in this uh, type of panel. Um, so it doesn't always work out perfectly, but that's the general rule. Yeah, fantastic. OK, right. So um, is, or is there anything else on this image or shall we skip to the next one? No, let's go. Let's go. So uh, another panel, another fantastic looking yeah, panel. And, and, and again, as you say, this is black. This is not with color differences to the yes. track circuits. This is black. That's it. But you can see there's little white bits that indicate the limits um, of, yeah, of where the track circuit starts and ends. That's it. This is my favorite panel. This is Swindon, which is the panel in the background behind me. <laughs> um, I won't labor it, but you can see again that all of A, B and C are all entrances that could lead to an exit button that's where D is off the end of the page. These aren't buttons. These are turn switches, just to show that you can do it with turn switches instead of push buttons. Um, only C will have a route to E, and E will have a route to D. Does it make sense that you can't get from A or B to E? Yes. Good. So you can't do that. That, that because doesn't work. If you can read one, you can read them all. You know how to work every single panel in the whole country now. <laughs> That's it. We're all professionals. Why... That's it, yeah. The reason why I included this slide, even though it's embarrassingly covered in stickers, uh, <laughs> is because you'll notice that this one is made up of small little mosaic squares, where the previous one was on big sheets of metal, this one, that's it, is made up of mosaic squares. And this was quite a good uh, technological um, advancement. I'm not saying that, you know, this was invented and then everyone said, yes, let's do that. There are still panels installed that aren't mosaics and there are different size of mosaic tiles, all different manufacturers things. But these pull out. So it's really easy to adjust the layout. If you have a, a signaling alteration or a P-way alteration, you only need to pull out and rewire uh, the mosaic tiles uh, that are actually affected. You don't need to replace the whole panel. Um, and so I think it's I think it's brilliant. And, yeah, and, and what's interesting is so that adjusting the panel remains one of the more expensive. Even even when we describe adjusting the panel, and we don't actually mean adjusting a physical panel anymore. In lots of instances, we we actually mean modifying the, the the what's wired in as the panel into the into the modern kind of whatever it happens to be in in the root operating center. But it's funny that Ooh. we still have this nomenclature of you know modifying the panel as being a complex thing, and and it and it's, it kind of comes. I suppose that's referring to this this period when you, you know it'd be in the previous image you've got to lift out the whole thing. This whole thing need, would need to be altered. Okay. Uh, whereas uh, here you can see a little more convenient. You can swap things out. Yeah. Yeah. I even like here. There's a there's a, a a a mosaic panel here that I've highlighted that says P way cabin on it. Uh, yes, and it's got the phone number underneath. That's yes. what that's there for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, so definitely. you can give them a, give them a ring. Um, and this, I mean, there are still many companies that make panels, but there are still, this is a Henry Williams panel. Henry Williams still makes them today. They're still being installed brand new. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. So that was another panel. Now, this is where we, I, I just alluded to it a little bit. I almost shot your fox there, Danny. Um, solid state interlocking. So yeah. this is, and, and this actually... Is the next yeah sorry no no go on go on i was gonna say this is the next generation we went from mechanical we went to electromechanical, and as i think you mentioned some people mentioned in the comments so you can just do this on computer well mm. let's get on with it then yeah <laughs> um, once we get computers or once we got computers to the stage where you could rely on the safety critical parts to fail safe um then, then bingo. Uh, and in the late 1980s, Banavi, uh, Radio Electronic Token Block Center, was the mm. first uh, um, uh, electronic interlocking. That's going to be controversial because uh, Lemmington Spa was the first um, on a panel. And there's always an argument over which was first. Ah, I see. Okay. So you can condense, again, this law of decreasing spaces, you can condense a massive room of electromechanical interlocking into a few racks of... Um, uh, solid state interlocking. I should point out that the picture on the screen is not actually of a solid state interlocking. Um, in fact, should we just we go to the next slide and then go oh, back yeah, to this go one? For it. So that... yeah. Oh no. Okay, I've got my slides in the wrong order. That oh, keep going. This one. one more. That one. Yeah. 
So this is a bit more useful in terms of the actual hardware of a solid state interlocking, although I'm afraid to say neither of these are solid state interlockings, but they are just racks that go in a 19 inch rack. They look similar, but they're not on to the things on the left hand side. The things on the left hand side is the panel processor equipment for the panel itself, the thing that does the selection and determines whether or not you're allowed to ask the interlocking for what you've asked it for. And that picture on the left, um, the panel in it is Leamington Spa panel. Because it was the first and it was a, a research project, there were two panels made. One went to Leamington Spa and the other one uh, was in the British Rail Research Establishment in Derby, where it still is in a training centre run by Signet Training. And it's still there and it's still used for training. It's absolutely fantastic. Oh, I think is... I know which bit of the RTC that's in, actually, because it's not. It was on the, in the opposite building. I remember Signet still being there. It was in the opposite building to where Atkins were, where I... Uh, oh, where right. I, I don't know where Atkins yeah, were. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Ah, so I, it's I'm... brilliant. So there are... They're obviously very, very difficult to make computers fail safe. So there's redundancy in this uh, solid state interlocking. And there's three interlocking sort of brains in it. And everything that the interlocking gets asked, each one of these three brains uh, determines the answer. And the three answers uh, go into, and I know this is going to, this is a weasel thing to say, but they go into a foolproof voting computer. Well, how come <laughs> that's foolproof for the others? I don't know. Okay. But <laughs> yeah. the inputs are cross proved with each other. The outputs are cross proved. You can detect if there's a fault, if different things are going in or different things are coming out, or the answer that you get is different. And if all three agree, it happens. We'll come to how it happens in a minute. If one of them disagrees, the other two gang up on it and put it out of use and carry on as a two. And you can carry on as a two. If the two remaining ones disagree, they put each other out of use and that's the end of the interlocking. The whole thing shuts down. But obviously that doesn't happen uh, in practice uh, because it's highly tested and highly skilled and it all, it all nicely works. Now, if we... Um, and let's stay at this page, actually. So I'm afraid I haven't got a picture of the interlocking, but it looks very similar to what's on the left-hand side there. It's just racks with LEDs and blinking lights. Um, and in the 1980s and 1990s, when they were installing them, certainly in the places where I worked, like Slough ICC and Swin and B, which were ICCs, um, great racks of interlocking. And um, over time, it's, it's got a lot smaller and required a lot fewer racks. The um, interlocking's instructions don't go out down mechanical rodding and they don't go out down just a cable with a light on the end of it. They go down a network and, uh, you know, it's, it's not an IP network, but it is a network um, with, with data flying around on mm. it. And they arrive at these things on the right hand side, which are called trackside functional modules. And they're in the locs on the side of the track. Um, and they have a number of inputs and outputs. The red one is called a signal module and the black one is called a points module. The points one is specifically designed for points. The red one is designed for signals and everything else. Now, and have have I, seen, of... I just interrupt. Where have I seen those colours before? Now, this seems familiar. Ah, uh, this... yes. <laughs> ah, now, yes. Brilliant. Um, they have got, uh, well, sorry, they're dumb to start with. They're just inputs and outputs. Um, they only know what their location on the network is because it's like uh, it's uh, wired into the plug. So when you put it in and plug it in, it learns who it is. The plug is the address. It does have some, uh, I wouldn't say intelligence, but it does have some safeguards in it. For example, if it loses communication with the interlocking, it knows which of its outputs are red signals mm -hmm. and it just lights them up red. Uh, and that's the end of it. And it doesn't input anything into the interlocking. And if it's a set of points, it just won't move them. It's designed from day one to be absolutely fail safe. Um, what's in the middle there is uh, extremely simplified, just to make that very clear, extremely simplified SSI uh, data. There's a layout at the top. It's got a signal number 12, set of points number 803, and two track circuits numbered RT and RU, Romeo Tango and Romeo Uniform. And if we look at Romeo Tango, you'll see it's got A, B, and C at its extremities, and that's just so you can identify a route through the track circuit, let's just say. So in the code, uh, this is a function uh, called QR12A. Uh, and it's the root request for signal number 12 and the A root. If there's more than one root, they go A, B, C from left to right. So this is the A root and it's the left hand most root. So it'll be taking the straight route. And it goes uh, if root number 12A, A, A for available. So if root number 12A is available, then check the U and U stands for root. I know this is complicated. Root Romeo Tango. That's the name of the track from B to A is free. The small F means free. 
So we're checking that no other train is routed across Romeo Tango from B to A, because obviously that, that would be incongruent with clearing signal number 12. Next, we'll check routes on Romeo Uniform from B to A are free. So that's the next track. You don't have to check every track because there are reasons why you don't that mean some aren't relevant. But in this case, we've checked both. And that points 803 are either commanded to normal or free. If they're already normal, that's fine. Or they're free to move to normal. It's like the equivalent of the LR, the lock relay. The lock relay is up. Um, CNF, control to normal or free, because we need them in normal. And if they're not in normal, we need them to be free to go to normal. So if all of that is met, then, so it's just if and then, very standard like computing stuff. Route 12A set. We're going to set route uh, at 12A, points 803 to be commanded to normal. So if they're not already, they're now going to be commanded to normal. And the route along, so U for route, Romeo Tango, A to B, this is the direction we're going along Romeo Tango, and the small L means locked. So we're putting a lock on the, the subroute Romeo Tango from A to B. Therefore, you can imagine if there was another uh, subroutine that we were looking at for a route to come to conflict with the route that we're now setting, it would check what we've just locked and go, oh, I can't have that because R12A has got it. Uh, we'll do the same then, route RU from A to B, we'll lock that. And uh, the button for signal 12, we will clear the pull. And the pull is pulling up the route, is cancelling the route. We don't want the route to be in a pulled, in a cancelled state anymore. We're cancelling that that bit that says the button is pulled. It's not pulled anymore. Pulling is, is going to put it back to danger. And then the slash dot is the end of the subroutine. Exactly as I illustrated with electromechanical locking circuitry and with mechanical locking, this is a very simple example. And uh, the real stuff is a lot, lot more uh, complicated. Are you happy with that? Uh, indeed. Sorry, I've been annotating while you described. Hopefully in a yeah, useful way for her, <laughs> in yeah, everyone just... following. I have been, you'll, look now at the, you'll look now at the scribbles, and I've been broadly following your, uh, your description. But yeah. You've been doing a great job. And you see there that that's a panel controlling a solid-state interlocking. We can have a VDU system, which is what we're going to look at now, controlling solid-state yep. interlocking. I don't know if anywhere there's a mechanical lever frame controlling a solid-state interlocking, oh, well, but it's uh, yeah. no reason why there couldn't be. And yes. So if we can go back one slide to the flowchart thing, thanks. Now, this is just the, the, the three types of signaling that we've looked at and how they're laid out on the ground. It's starting in the top left. When we had a panel or a lever frame in a small box, let's say, the interlocking is in the same building and there's wires that go to the trackside equipment. Very simple. In the 1950s, Certainly panels were being installed in 1960. In the second row down, we invented this non-vital electronic link. It's like a modem, an early version of a modem, where in the panel we can say, please, can we have this route? And it can go down this like telephone wire to the interlocking that is at the site. And it could be tens, maybe even hundreds, but I don't know if there are any examples, of miles away. And it doesn't matter if that little rubbishy twisted pair with loads of interference and whatever gets it wrong because the interlocking is going to take place after it's gone through that non-vital electronic link. The interlocking is at the site, not at the panel. And the interlocking is directly linked to the trackside equipment via wires. And normally, or quite often, in fact, there's a diverse route. So if one of those uh, non-vital electronic links fails, you've got another one. When we moved into the, the solid state interlocking era, and obviously technology had moved on and networking had moved on a lot, and it did become possible to do safety critical data transmission over a network, which wasn't possible in the middle diagram. So VSCS is a general term, VDU based signaling control system. There are many different types. That's it, the interlocking is at the panel or at the ICC or at the signaling center or whatever. And then there's a network with all the trackside functional modules on it, and they all listen out for their own address and just obey, turn output number six on, input number three has just gone live, whatever it is, they just feed it back to the interlocking. The technology wasn't available in the 50s and 60s and 70s to have um, uh, safety critical transmission uh, over a network. No, I mean, yeah, I, for me, e even even though I've been doing the, doing what I do for many, many years, lots of things are falling into place as I, as I kind of sit here and, 
and um, and get and get excited about why S and T is very the T is also very important as part of the S and T um, signaling and telecoms. Uh, yes, um, because the network is critical in making all this work. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So right. Okay. So, so let's go forwards. Let's go forward. So we are now skipping on to talking about those VDU visual display unit based signaling control systems. That's it. And uh, and here is here is one here is a uh, here is the, the, what the panel looked like. Uh, I mean, it's right. an IECC panel. This one. That's an IECC. So IECC is a proprietary term. It's a brand name. Um, so it is a VDU based signaling control system. It is an IECC. There are other types of VDU signaling control system. There's WestCAD, for example. That's a popular one. You can just about see, and we'll look in more detail in a minute, that um, the what's on the screens is a map that looks very similar to what it looked like on a panel or a mechanical diagram. Um, and it's got signals on it. In fact, I'll talk about that in a second because the next picture is a close-up. Mm. Key things here are, though, obviously you've got the VDU screens. You can just see in the middle of the desk, there's a yellow ball called the tracker ball. And that's like the mouse. That's how you move the crosshairs around the screens. Um, and the buttons around it are how you press things. They're like the mouse buttons. At the very top, there's three circle buttons, which are labeled normal, center, and reverse. Sounds very similar to mechanical lever frames. Uh, and that's how, if you need to operate points on the individual point switch, you operate them to normal, center, and reverse. You move the cursor to the appropriate set of points and click where you want it to go. It's root setting. We're definitely well into the era where we everything is root setting. So normally they all live in center, but we might need to put them into normal or reverse explicitly. Hmm. The two square buttons underneath that are called the cancel buttons, and they're exactly the same. They do the same thing. It's just if you're left-handed or right-handed, you might want to press one on the left or one on the right. And that's like pulling the button on the panel or putting a lever back to normal in the mechanical lever frame. It's going to the safe position. It's cancel. It's going to put the signal to danger. It's going to stop whatever is taking place from taking place. And then just below those to the left and right, there's two circular buttons and they're called the set buttons. And again, they are the same. It's just if you're left or right handed, you can use whichever one you like. And they are the thing that's going to operate equipment that's going to reverse a lever. Still entrance and exit. You still press where you want to start and press where you want to end on the little picture of the signal. Um, and, and they're called the set button. Um, and you get really attuned without looking down at the tracker board all the time that your fingers just feel whether you're clicking a set button or a cancel button until the day that one of them breaks and <laughs> the technician comes around and says, oh, well, I haven't got a square button in stock, so I'll just replace it with a round one for now and tomorrow <laughs> a square one will put it in. You go, okay, that's absolutely fine. Just put a round one in. And it blows your mind because your fingers go for the buttons and you feel a corner and it's like getting an electric shock off the thing because you think, oh, no, I'm about to press the wrong button. And you don't realize how natural operation of the tracker ball becomes um, until, they say, one of those ge geometric shapes changes. And even though there's only one crosshairs on the screen, everyone that's used to working a VDU signaling system with a tracker ball, and they don't fit them with tracker balls anymore, unfortunately. They have normal mice now, which I hate. Um, the tracker ball, you can sit down, your hand will land on the tracker ball, and it will move it exactly the right amount, and the crosshairs will stop exactly where you want it. It just is so natural once you get used to it. Mm. Um, you don't have to go, oh, where is it? Scroll, 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 or I haven't quite got it lined up. Uh, it's really good. The keyboard to the right is a command line interface with the IECC, and I think every uh, VDU signaling system will have a keyboard interface. Some things have to be done by keyboard. Almost everything that can be done by the trackable can be done by the keyboard as well, mm. in case the trackable fails. Uh, yeah, yeah. And normally they fail because they get full up with food and gunge and dust and grub and stuff <laughs> like that. And the little feelers inside won't, won't start going round. Uh, telephones, obviously you know what a telephone is. Uh, the, um, the screen nearest us on the left-hand side is a telephone concentrator for signal post telephones and box-to-box -box phones and all those things. It's ah, just touch yeah. screen and you press what you want. Ah, nice, yeah. The next, the next screen over is Cab Secure Radio, which doesn't exist anymore. Heathrow Express was the last thing to have it. I'm pretty sure it was like the, pre it was a much earlier version of GSMR. Mm. It's not the same technology at all, but it's like you could, you could equate it to what GSMR yeah, now I remember, is. I remember the articles coming out when they switched it off uh, because it had been superseded. Yeah, um, that's it. Yeah. And the keyboard below is just the keyboard for the Cab Secure Radio, and the little telephone next to it is the telephone for the Cab Secure Radio. 
The third monitor along is called the general purpose screen, and that contains output from the ICC, things that it wants you to know, little text messages. Um, if, an, if a piece of equipment hasn't responded correctly, as well as you being able to see it on the indications, it will go blip and it will pip up on the screen to say, ah, this has happened, and it will flash until you acknowledge it to say, yes, I, I recognize that that has happened. Um, this is uh, incidentally the Southall workstation at Slough ICC, which closed in about 2011 and it moved to the Thames Valley Signaling Centre. Mm -hmm. So this was in Slough. Over in the top left-hand side of the image, that was the Paddington workstation, uh, and there was a third uh, shift manager's desk and an electric desk um, in the early years of Slough. Um, this was one of the boxes that I worked in. It was absolutely fantastic, and I loved working there. But this was the Southall workstation. Yeah, there we go. I mean, yeah, it's just it's just fascinating. It's really useful to have the, that breakdown. Fascinating to see it, and and I mean, lots of other lots of other tidbits around as well, like the like buttons up here that that will do sensible things. And yes, and... so they're they're called ESOC buttons, emergency signals on controls, huh. and they are for uh, protecting the line when you can't do it with the ICC. They're not for operating emergencies like spads and derailments and things like that. Therefore, if you lose control of the ICC, if the screens fail, for example, if the power goes off and all the screens go off, or if for some reason you have trackable failure and keyboard failure at the same time. And in early installations, all they used to do when you press them was cut off the power to the interlocking. And, and which, all it, which automatically then makes it fails like drop safe That's for it. everything yeah all the track side functional modules will go hang on a minute there's no interlocking talking to me i'll go into red retaining mode or maybe not red retaining mode actually that's slightly different but that i'll put my signal to red i know which ones are red um, and that'll be it but of course once you press them then you've definitely lost control of the interlocking they're not for spads and things like that if you press them when you have a spad you will then lose control of doing anything mm. about the spad don't need to provide them anymore. We've got GSMR now for stopping trains independently from the signaling system. Uh, and also we're just, I guess, a bit more confident that the signaling system won't fail in such a disastrous way. Whereas when it's all brand new, um, it, uh, it was all new and, and nobody really know what the... Well, yeah, I mean, it, again, it becomes an ergonomics... Characteristics. Yeah, it becomes an ergonomics thing. You want uh, people who are new to the system who have moved from different type, you know previous yeah. generations need the confidence that they can you know they, it's almost a reassurance when they move to this new system that they've uh, got the fail safe there we go so that's it yeah. you said you'd put them up well we've got two we've actually got two here uh of the of the actual vdu outputs uh, mm. uh and uh, yeah right so, so there are two uh, there are two types um and this is london paddington um and this is called the overview and let's, if we can, briefly go forward to the detail view and then come back, if that's yeah, sure. all right. Yeah. So that's the overview. That's the detail view. Oh, my. Yeah. So you can see. Yes. You can see the difference so, there. Yes. <laughs> so on the overview, uh, you get all the track layout. You get every single main aspect signal. But you don't get the ground position lights. You can see where the trains are because they're shown in red. Very similar to a panel, very similar to a mechanical lever frame. You can see where the routes have been set in the white. Same as white route lights on a panel. Excuse me. And it's still entrance exit. So the crosshairs is right down at the bottom where it says VW2, where I took the photo. That's it. The crosshairs happens to be there at the moment. So to set a route using the entrance exit functionality, you'd move the crosshairs to the signal where you want to start. You'd press it. It would start to flash exactly like on a panel. You'd press the next signal or buffer stops where you'd want it to end. And then if it could, if the route was free, it would move all the points. They would flash. And then the white route lights will become continuous between the start and end. Remember, I said we don't actually care what color the signal showing once it's proceed. And everything up to a panel generally only showed on or off. It didn't show whether it was yellow or double yellow or green. And IACC and I think all VDU signaling systems, if they can, if the interlocking has the information to show, uh, will show the actual color that the signal mm. is showing, including if it's flashing, it will flash on the screen. You don't get to see the feathers. You don't get to see the stencil boxes. You only get to see the color, uh, the position light, and whether it's flashing or not. Because I suppose, again, it's workload, and, and it's you don't want too much. on screen. It's simplicity is the name of the game. Yeah. And some of that information, yeah. for example, the feathers, actually, I mean, the interlock, if those aren't showing because they failed, that'll lock, out, lock things out. But actually, the feathers That's are it. really for driver information, right? So, exactly. So yes. The yeah. feathers are doing the job of this white up here by showing where the route is set. Yeah, Every train's got a number. I won't go into that now. That's a whole other video, but every train's yeah. got a number. So wherever there's some red, you'll see that there is a number that relates to it, even if it's not shown on the red at that exact moment. If you follow the white route lights where the red is going, there'll be a, 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 an identity. 
So just to give an example, in Platform 3 down at the bottom, one Charlie 36, Class 1, First Great Western Express train, London to Bristol or the West Country, or Bristol in this case, came in as one Alpha 97, again, a, a First Great Western HST at the time, which came up from the West Country to London Paddington. Um, and the last two numbers are just obviously index numbers, but the first two numbers are really important. And the signalman will know every single one of them, and you couldn't possibly work it unless you knew them all already. You don't have time to look it all up in the timetable. But there's no signal numbers on this page. There's no point numbers. You can't see which way the points are lying, any of that stuff. It just wouldn't fit. And bearing in mind, this is made out of ASCII art. This isn't a vector drawing. This yeah. is made out of squares and triangles and things. There's only so many rows and columns on the page. So the detail view, Q detail view, you get a detail view on an ICC for every area. Hmm. And you can switch information on and off. So this is the detail view of the south side of Paddington. It's only got platforms one, two. I can't quite see platform nine. That's it. Yeah, nine. And when I took this photo, I deliberately switched all the information on to see everything. But you can switch on and off the point numbers. So uh, like in the bottom, uh, just outside platform number one, there's eight zero zero one Bravo points. That's the point number. You can switch on and off the track circuit numbers. So just to the right of that is Papa Alpha Charlie track. And you can switch on and off the signal numbers. So just to the right of that is number one signal, the first signal, Sierra November one. They don't put the prefix on, expect it to know the prefix. And you can switch them all on and off based on what you need. You never need them all on uh, like it shows here. And you'll notice now the cursor down at the bottom is on view window three, VW three. And that's because these views are fixed. You can't drag them around. You've got sometimes three and sometimes four monitors up to eight views and you can pick which one you want. Now, technology has actually moved on a bit since these pictures were taken, and now you can get signaling systems that are made uh, with the map out of vectors rather than ASCII art, and you can get it where you can zoom in and zoom out and drag the diagram around and all those things. Uh, but this is my favorite uh, type of VDU signaling system, so that's what you've got here. Um, oh, on platform number four, you can see a little white dot at the end of the platform, at the left-hand end of the platform. That's it. TRTS indication. So remember we talked about TRTS indication in Exeter West, a little wooden instrument on a block shelf. Ah, uh, yes. Have them on panels, just a little light. You get them on ICCs, just a little white flashing thing. This IECC, this VDU-based signaling system, happens to be controlling a solid-state interlocking. But it could very easily, and many do, control a relay interlocking. Obviously, it couldn't control a mechanical interlocking. Um, so you can see that it's not fixed as to what type of interface you have as to what type of equipment uh, you have to control um, or, or what manufacturer it comes from or what age it is. You can replace one without the other, and we frequently do in order to do um, upgrade work. We might replace the trackside equipment this year with the signaling center next year, the track circuits the year after for axle counters or whatever. Um, it's great. And I, I, I spot other ancillary information, for example, that is important for the signaler, such as the limit of... Uh of uh of ole uh yeah you know, there's there's all sorts of other bits of information that are useful s for That's the it. signaler to know to make sure they're they're letting the driver know so the driver knows that they're going into the right uh in, in as well so it's, it's that it's and it comes back to that flow diagram that you put up in fact which That's the next slide which is the next slide and it's that really? it's that flow of information and we've talked about everything on it this is it. We've covered. We've covered the, the that flow and, and and yeah, exactly. It's it's fascinating. I mean, Danny, that's been fantastic. We have run very long. Um, yeah. Sorry to those who are, who are watching uh, or have come back after the third go to to finish it off. But I think it's worth it because it is really interesting and and it's been a really good breakdown into the into the into the. It's really nice to see that the flow, the connection. You know, things like the colours in the um in the in the kind of so the the, the reds and whites continuing through and, and all these sorts of things it's just it's and the blacks for for it's just really interesting um there's so, so much stuff and like that signaling alphabet when i said like 8hr that's still used and h really stands for home signal which comes out of the mechanical yes, era yeah, there's yeah. so much historical mm. link to be made between what we have now and what we had 170 odd years ago and the reason for that is because of uh, as much as anything else it's safety it's the it's systems that we are we understand well and that we adapt and we modify and we we tweak them and, and it's a continuing evolution there's, there's very rarely a radical revolution it's a continuing evolution and actually i think it's worth saying um, and we'll touch on this in uh, next episode as well, actually, is that 
the digital railway, as it's called, which really is just a, a brand name for all sorts of different underlying systems, follows all the same rules and logic. It's following all the same signaling laws and rules. It just happens to be, a, if you like, a bit of an evolution, a bit of an evolution through again. Um, Danny, that's that's fantastic. Uh, I'm now going to press this button here. Um, and we'll come back to we'll we, I'll press this button and say thanks to everyone who listened to that. In, uh, in we are available on all podcasting platforms. Uh, I hope that was all right. Uh, um, we described that suitably, but actually, I think Danny did a sterling job of describing in really nice detail of exactly what what was on screen. Um, uh, the next thing I need to do is press uh, this and say uh, you can support me on Patreon, patreoncom Dennis to make these happen more and come and chat in the Discord server where many people are now going to be chatting about signaling for a very long time, which I'm happy to say. Uh, and then you can chuck me pennies on PayPal if you so wish as well. Um, so, Danny, there now d- d- chance for a plug. The Swindon Panel Society, Danny. Yes. So I suspect a lot of people will already be aware. But if you're not, Swindon Panel, which is an NX mosaic panel with an mecha- electromechanical relay interlocking, uh, closed in 2016. And a group that I am involved in bought it, moved it to Didcot Railway Centre, uh, and then wired it all back so that it works exactly like the real thing. You can set routes, you can do all the interlocking functionality, the trains move around and obey the signals. And if there's somebody sitting in a little room at the back of the building with the telephones, they'll even ring you up and, uh, <laughs> and talk to you. So you can come and view it. Uh, there's a website there uh, which says when we're open, uh, we're not open every single day that Didcot Railway Centre is open. Uh, but I think in August, we're open nearly every weekend day. Um, so have a look on there uh, and come and visit us. And you can have a go uh, at signaling trains, and if you really like it, you might become a member and then you can book it out for the day and signal trains all day long. Oh. <laughs> it's a lot like SimSig, but it's an actual panel rather than an actual IECC like SimSig is. Yeah, I see. So, and, and that's and that. I, sorry, go on. No, I just said that's that's that. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Marvin. So, I mean, I would love to. I, I think there should be a future episode of Rail Matter where I come along and visit and uh, and you gu- and and someone someone in this society, whether it's you or someone else, guides guides us through. That'd be that'd be mm. absolutely wonderful. So, uh, yeah, so cool. Swindon Panel Society, SwindonPanel.org.uk for those listening in audio only format. Go to the website and have a look. Um, and shout out to the other um, sort of restored uh, or kind of signal boxes and panels that we mentioned through the episode as well. Um, there are a lot of them, surprisingly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, because they are things of they are wonderfully beautiful objects. Even even forgetting the history, they are they are beautiful objects to be preserved. These things, Ooh. because they had to be ergonomic, they are designed beautifully. They they they, they had to be because if they weren't beautiful, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be functional. You know, the yes. the, the form follows the function, but then by necessity they have to be um, usable, visually striking uh, fe- uh, objects. Anyway, right. So, um. Bessie has been painting ballast beautifully uh, to support Samaritans and is po- possibly, as we speak, uh, auctioning some off. Uh, I think the first is possibly going to be the... Uh, it's possibly the other way. I can't remember. I might be wrong on that. It could be the windmill. Um, uh, Bessie, go 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 onto Twitter. Look for hashtag Team Samaritans. Find Bessie on, on Twitter. Um, and uh, you will spot uh, ballast, beautifully painted little ballast art for sale. I think these are wonderful. So uh, go and do that. Uh, and, and Bessie, thanks for, for letting me plug this because I think that I just wanted to have this slide up. It's beautiful. Um, next episode, which is next week, episode 69. Nice. It's uh, how to make trains go faster with Steve Wood. It's another, it's essentially, not although not specifically, it is essentially another signaling episode you'll be glad to hear. Um, we, yeah. also, we also did a better job of, of, um, of keeping it tight. So if you're, if, you're, if, if, if you're struggling to fit five hours of signaling um, into, into kind of the space of two weeks, then don't worry, it's a, it's a little short next time. So, um, uh, but I'm, don't worry, Danny, I'm glad we went as long as we did on this one because there was plenty to cover. So that's next week with Steve Wood. Um, I'm now going to bring Danny back. Danny, you're back in big face mode, um, because, if nothing else, so we can see Swindon panel behind you nice and clearly. Um, oh, that was fantastic. Great. It was. Thank you so much for uh, for, for joining That's us, fine. for going through that. I realised the chat went off and I didn't look at the chat much, everyone in the chat. Thanks for joining us. Uh, but uh, yes, it... it Conscious of time, so catch the catch questions in the uh, in the Discord uh, if you have questions, and and indeed I can send those through to Danny if you've got questions for Danny specifically. I can email those and get those questions and ans- answered back for you. Um, I should uh, caveat it then by saying that there are many different answers to everything yeah. that I <laughs> yeah, said. Yeah. So if you disagree, that is fine. I was just trying to give one example of everything. Absolutely, yeah. There there, there are many many. I mean, signaling is complicated, and and as a, a permanent way engineer. Who uh, you know? I just use lump hammers. It's uh, it's a wonderful uh, 
Black Art, which I um, has, which I think you have revealed quite wonderfully uh, in tonight's episode. Danny, thank you so much. Um, you. It only really remains remains for uh, for both of us actually to uh, to bid everyone a uh, to bid everyone a farewell. Uh, thanks, Danny. Thanks everyone for watching, and uh, and, and cheerio, cheerio.